Hello. Hello and welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Aisha Blake and I am the Director of Developer Relations for Pluralsight. I am really excited. This is my first Tech Skills Day as a member of the Pluralsight team. This is our fourth annual Tech Skills Day. So I'm really, really excited to lead us all into the event. So Tech Skills Day is really a celebration of our community. We're gonna start off with two absolutely wonderful keynote sessions, which will then lead into technical talks, career discussions, Q and A, and an opportunity to really connect with all of the other attendees uh, and start to have some conversations based on what you've learned and what you've heard throughout the day. Uh, so. We've got a couple of keynotes for you to start off the day. I'm gonna guide you through kind of that section of the day. Uh, we're gonna start off with a, an absolutely wonderful session from Scott Hanselman of mentorship, sponsorship, and storytelling. And then we're gonna move into how to build projects that get you hired by Forest Brazil. Uh, we'll split into two tracks after that, cloud skills and developer skills. And we'll absolutely have breaks for each session. So you don't have to sit through the whole day. We'll uh, break it up so that you're able to kind of take everything in. So, on our ACG cloud skills track, you'll hear talks like cybersecurity is for everyone from Gita Sharma and a closer look at building data collection solutions in the cloud with Banjo Obayami. Obayomi. In the Pearl Site skills track, you're going to hear talks from our very own David Neal on JavaScript past, present, and future as well as a dive into building your first Terraform module with Ned Bellavance. After all of that, uh, at the end of the day, you're gonna have a chance to meet and chat with other developers via our Gather platform. In addition to all of that, we've got a little bit of an activity for you. So, if you're paying attention throughout all of these different sessions, you're going to see uh, some sunglass stickers popping up all over the place. So we're running a sunglasses Easter hunt, Easter egg hunt. Uh, we've got those stickers hidden throughout the event. So keep an eye out and tally them up when you spot them. Uh, at the end, you're going to be invited to submit your guess as to how many of those sunglasses stickers you found throughout the day, uh, how many you think there have been throughout the day, and the first five closest guesses without going over, so Price is Right rules, are going to win some really cool swag, including a Loom Cube panel, a Lark self-cleaning bottle, and an Oculus Quest 2. I'll help you out. I'll give you a little bit of a hint. The first one was in the agenda slide and this one counts too. All right. So the, I am gonna go ahead and introduce our first keynote speaker. I am so, so excited to share uh, this, this talk with you. Um, what I love about both of our keynote sessions today is they're super actionable. You're going to hopefully be inspired and energized by them, but also you're going to walk away with some really actionable steps that you can take to take your tech career to the next level. So with that, I'm gonna start off by introducing Scott Hanselman. Uh, Scott is a former professor, a former chief architect in finance. He's now a speaker, a consultant, a father, and a Microsoft employee. He is a failed stand-up comic, a corn rower, and a book author. 
And that's him today. He'll be different tomorrow. I really, really appreciate the the kindness and the joy that Scott brings to not just his talks, but the way that he teaches tech. It's something that really inspires me as an educator. And it's so meaningful to me that he was able to uh, put the stock together for us and share it with us. And so I know we're running a little bit ahead of schedule, but um, I'd love to lead you into mentorship, sponsorship, and storytelling by Scott Hanselman. Hey friends, I'm Scott Hanselman. Welcome to Pluralsight Tech Skills Day. I'm very excited to be chatting with you today. I've got an interesting talk that I enjoy doing called Mentorship, Sponsorship, and Storytelling. And uh, when I submitted this talk, uh, the folks at Pluralsight were excited about it, uh, but I was already told that my slides were unprofessional because apparently you're not supposed to use Comic Sans. Uh, in your slides. So uh, I immediately went and tried to fix that and I brought in some like professional font people and this is what I came up with. Uh, but then uh, Aisha from Pluralsight was like, you know, you need like some evocative stock photography, maybe something that shows what a, a tech person's desk looks like. So of course I took a picture of my perfect desk with the sunlight streaming in on a Sunday morning. I know that we all have desks that look like this, right? Uh, real computer people have desks like this. Uh, but no, this is kind of what a typical computer person's desk looks like. But then I realized, as I was making that joke, and I say, well, a real computer person's desk looks like this, or a real computer person's desk looks like that, is that I'm starting to evoke already without uh, meaning to a sense of gatekeeping. Because what if you're saying, well, my desk doesn't look that neat, or my desk doesn't look that, that unorganized. What does a real computer person's desk look like? Well, it looks like whatever the heck you want it to look like. And that is so important. I want you to feel welcome. The friends at Pluralsight want you to feel welcome. And we don't want you to feel like a computer person looks like anything or anyone. Now, when you go out there on the internet, you're going to find a ton of folks that are going to tell you how things need to be done. And they're going to say, well, you know, you're in the middle of a pandemic. And if you didn't learn Pascal, Chinese, and JavaScript during the pandemic, then what were you doing with all that spare that's all that spare time. That's hustle culture. And you don't want to get too into hustle culture because if you're not hustling, then you feel bad, right? And people tell you that you have to behave a certain way. And I have to ask them, is hustle culture healthy? Yes, it's good to hustle. Yes, it's good to work hard. Is it good to work 100 hours a week? Is it work worth watching and binging on every plural site course? Eh, maybe not. Maybe you want to think about how you're moving through the world. You cannot just uh, wake up, kick butt, and repeat. You have to take uh, a little self-care, and that's super important. Now, as a remote worker, I've worked remotely for Microsoft now for almost 15 years. Uh, when the quarantine happened, everyone gave me a call and said, hey, Scott, tell us all about what it's like to work remotely. And I had to remind them that remote work and quarantine work are not the same thing. It's a very, very different situation. Uh, remote work is a joy. We can stay home, I can go to McDonald's, I can go to Starbucks, I can work from my laptop. It's, it's, a, it's a very glamorous thing. But being trapped in your house is not super uh, glamorous. And unfortunately, in the time that uh, the quarantine's been going down, we're all feeling a pressure to overwork. We're, we're finding ourselves with less commutes and thereby more time to delete email and watch Pluralsight courses and do stuff like that. And that pressure to overwork can be incredibly, incredibly stressful. I've also been finding myself uh, doing a bit of doom scrolling, which is I'm not sure what I'm scrolling for, but I am I'm looking for doom because everything's bad and the world is ending. And if I don't get my act together quickly, I'm going to be fired at work. This is super important for us to talk about as a community because there's a feeling that your neighbor, that your friend, that your coworker is doing better than you in some way. And we don't have those conversations in public. And I know that our friends in Pluralsight want us to be our full and complete selves and talk about uh, what we know, what we don't know, to be deliberate, to be intentional, 
and to really be present in the moment. So what I've started to do as I improve my learning, as I improve myself at work and personally, is I've started to be uh, focused on deliberate practice, be as, be as awake as I can be. And I've started by making a nest. I made a nest at home. I think you should make a nest as well. You take a look at my, my background right here, and uh, this is what I call the million dollar room that cost me 300 bucks. It's a cool background and you go, oh my goodness, I wish I had a fancy office like that. But ultimately these are Ikea Billy shelves. This is a $50 LED light. This is an arcade uh, that I got at a bar, painted black and put an Xbox inside. So you too can have a million dollar room for about $300 and a can of paint. The point being your room, your space is a nest. And just like birds make nests for their family, you need to make a nest for yourself so that you can be your best at work, your best in learning. And then when you have that space, when you have that space, you can ask yourself, instead of thinking about hustle culture, you say, you know, is now the time to create? Is now the time to learn? Am I going to start talking about my learning journey and maybe blogging about it? Well, I shouldn't blog, right? Because I'm not an expert yet. I'm still learning, right? I'm learning every day. But everyone is an expert at something. So maybe you should be thinking about uh, what you can blog about, perhaps your journey, perhaps the time that you're spending learning new technologies and interacting with the community. There's an opportunity here for all of us to share our experiences. Now, some of this might not seem like uh, the attitude and the style that you're used to. Uh, a lot of people enter tech and they don't feel welcome. They don't feel warm. So we should talk a little bit about attitude and style because not just I setting the tone here today in this short keynote, but others that you may interact with online or on Stack Overflow may be welcome and may be kind, and other ones may make you feel kind of kind of lousy. We all hope that tech welcomes you warmly. This is one of my favorite magazine covers from March of 1984. 1984, my friends. The young lady here is coding. She's got her pigtails. She's got her mouse and her TI-99. Uh, computer and she's coding away and that's what programmers looked like in March of 1984 but uh, sometimes if you watch uh, you know shows like uh, uh, you know like uh, on Nickelodeon you see these uh, what I call Power Rangers diversity where you basically get one of each flavor and it's always the same five kids no matter what the show is and that you see these quotes and one of the quotes that I that I always hear is is diversity is being invited to the party and inclusion is being asked to dance I'm like yeah I mean that's a good quote but let's be real right inclusion is being a member of the party planning committee right it's not about being asked to the table this is about actually building the table from scratch and this brings me to the very definition of that word inclusion Inclusion is the opposite of exclusion. That's all it is. So are we doing a thing that's excluding people and making them feel bad? Well, there was a time when we had this technology priesthood. No disrespect to our priests, but a couple of thousand years ago, there were the people who can read, people who had access to information, and then there were people who couldn't. And the people who couldn't read were stuck. They could only get their information from the people who chose to give it to them. And Ted Nelson here said that knowledge is power, so it tends to be hoarded, and experts rarely want people to understand what they do. Not our friends at Pluralsight, of course, because the information is available and it is here. This seems like a quote that could have been from 2020 or 2022. In fact, this is a quote from 1974. They were already watching out for technology gatekeeping. What's gatekeeping? It's just literally standing in front of the gate and saying you can't come in. It's just the people that control that information flow for a system. And that's why having access to training materials for learning, open source, blogs, Twitter, Stack Overflow is so important. Uh, that kind of information is available to you now on the internet. Never before has everything been so available for learning than today in 2022. We're seeing more and more folks that are moving up in tech, getting promoted, getting that first job because they have access to information. So we should put our information out there in the world. We should share our energy. We should share our energy and put out good work. That's what I personally have been trying to do. I've had a blog for 20 years. I've had a podcast for 16 years. I've been on the energy on any on the internet rather since its uh, inception, uh, at least for 30 years ago. And in the goal of being on the internet, what I've been trying to do is put out good work and avoid wasting my keystrokes. 
like keystrokes. What does that mean? Well, let's say that someone in the audience decides to send me a note. Let's say that Aisha says, hey, Scott, great talk. Good stuff. You know, and we're like, we, we're like social friends. Like we know each other on Twitter, but like, I don't really know her like that much, you know? So she's like, hey, Scott, here's a question. And the question is a gift. What a great question. I never thought about that question. I need to answer that question. I'm like, yeah, but I don't really know. I don't know her like that. Am I going to give her the gift of 3,000 of my keystrokes? That's going to take me like a half an hour. And then she's going to say, thanks. And then those keystrokes are gone. Those keystrokes are dead. I need to conserve my keystrokes, right? There's a finite number of keystrokes left in my hands before I die. So where should I put them? I'm never going to get more keystrokes back. I've actually gone, because I'm just that kind of a nerd, and I actually wrote a website called keysleft.com, where I can put in how old you are and how fast you type, and I will actually tell you exactly how many keystrokes you have left, and the number will go down as you sit on the website. This is assuming that you type four hours a day until you live to be 90, and it tells you exactly how many novels, how many computer programs, or emails to your boss you have left in your hands. So back to the original question. I get a great question from the audience. I don't know where I'm going to put that. You know, I'm not going to give away that. I'm not, gonna, I'm not trying to get it for the money. Maybe I should put it anywhere with a URL. Anywhere with a URL. Twitter, a blog, LinkedIn, Facebook. Maybe I'll make a Pluralsight course. And then I'll send a link to the course and I'll say, what a great question. I made a course for you. That's sharing your information in an efficient way. I've been spending all of this time uh, on the internet trying to not email people. Because when you email people, you just get back more email. So if someone asks you a question, make a, a SharePoint document, make a Word doc, put it in Google Docs, put it anywhere with a URL, and start sharing information. And not sharing it in the way of, I'm an expert, because we're all amateurs. We're all amateurs. There are no professionals. Everything that I learned in school is gone. Every, uh, every programming language that I ever learned is dead. Everything that I do today didn't exist when I started in computing. So then I have to be really honest with myself and say, do I have, do I have 20 years of experience? Or do I maybe have the same year 20 times? And this is a really interesting one because you'll come in, 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 uh, in contact with people sometimes like me, and they'll say, well, you know, I've got 30 years experience in the field. What does that really mean? What does that really mean? Well, that means that I haven't been chased out of tech. It means that I'm still here. It means that I've got resilience and I'm uh, somewhat lucky and uh, somewhat persnickety uh, that I'm not going to quit. But to be totally honest with you, in the last 30 years of being in tech and coding for money, I'm going to say maybe seven years of it, I was asleep. And I mean asleep in that, like, I was just kind of, you know, making some code and I wasn't really learning anything. I wasn't thinking about new, uh, new ways to interact with people. That's okay. That happens to the best of us. It doesn't mean you have to go back and do hustle culture. It doesn't mean you have to learn a new language every year. But it means that you need to wake up a couple of times a week and go, oh, what did I learn today? Did I, did I learn anything new? Did I think about something new today? And then you try to wake up multiple times a week. Have you ever been driving? And then you're like, you go four blocks and you're like, whoa, I'm driving. Just a moment. I'm not saying you fell asleep. You just weren't present while driving. That's what I'm talking about by, by waking up and saying, wow, you know, have I been interacting with my coworkers correctly? Have I been, if I've been using C-sharp in the way that I think it's supposed to be used? You know, I haven't even looked at Kubernetes in a while. Um, maybe I'm not an expert. This is really healthy introspection. And one of the people that I like to think about when I think about senior engineers, is I think about Tim Berners-Lee. Tim Berners-Lee invented the web. But when he gives a presentation, look at, his, look at his title. He didn't say senior web developer. He didn't even say the. What if he said the web developer? What would you do if you met someone at a party and they said, oh, what do you do? I'm a web developer. Oh, you're a web developer? No, no, I'm the web developer, right? That's a very healthy and mature attitude. I'm very sure that he does not know everything about the internet, uh, just the part that he invented, but the internet has grown, right? So I think he knows that it's probably, uh, you're never too old to get good advice. Maybe he has some, some mentors that are younger than him. 
So as I go out there and I try to learn more and I try to be more present in the community, um, I have mentees and I have m mentors. I am not too old to get good advice and neither are you, no matter what age you are. And you're never too young to share experiences. A lot of times the mentor-mentee relationship can be somewhat stilted and it becomes a weekly lecture from an old person. And I'm guilty of mentoring uh, some people where I was doing a big dad energy weekly lecture from an old person. And in fact, that was not what, was, what that person needed and that's not healthy. Mentors are supposed to be mirrors. They help you define your dream, help you with your strengths. They help you with advice. They don't lecture you. But the other thing that's important is there's a big difference between mentorship and sponsorship. Sponsorship is more important than mentorship right now. A lot of people, particularly underrepresented minorities, are over-mentored. If you want free advice from an old person, you can get that anywhere. But sponsorship means I've brought you into a room and I've stepped back and I've said, hey, you should talk to Tom. He's got some great ideas. Oh, I think that was actually Anna's project. Let me have Anna explain that to you. Sponsorship is really powerful because I, as a person who's been in tech for 30 years, have an unlimited amount of this level of privilege where I can just go, oh, you should talk to so-and-so. I can be all kinds of sponsors. What's cool about this and what's powerful about this is I could be a mentor. I could be a strategizer. But I can also be a connector. Oh, you should talk to Aisha. Oh, you should talk to Jeremy. They know about that. And then I just do a little connector. You can be an opportunity giver. Have you heard about the, the new plural site? Let me hook you up with a free uh, subscription. Maybe you should speak at their next event. I can advocate. Oh, you should definitely have, uh, you know, Saran speak at that event because she's great. Oh, yeah, I've seen her talk before. Costs me nothing to do that. So sponsorship is just as important as mentorship. So if you either are a mentee or you are currently mentoring, think about a way that you can turn that relationship into something that creates luck for people. Now, saying that things are lucky and saying that my, my life and my career has been shaped by luck does not in any way indicate I didn't work hard. It rather indicates that I had opportunity plus being prepared and they combined into luck. How many times have you bumped into someone on the subway or the bus and then you find out that maybe they work somewhere and they give you a business card and then your entire life changes and you move across the country? That happens all the time. But there's a ton of people out there who are prepared, they've watched the courses, they've done the certifications and they're ready to go, but they're just waiting for that opportunity to meet their preparedness. So I can be the luck. I actually made a hashtag, hashtag be the luck on Twitter. It could be that you give someone a laptop. It could be that you invite them to interview somewhere, that you take a look at their resume and you hand it to a friend with the warm introduction. The warm intro is super important. Those kind of things are all the kinds of things that people who are preparing, whether it be on Pluralsight or other places, they are prepared. They just need an opportunity. And I, as a, uh, an elder millennial, uh, have an unlimited amount of uh, the ability to go into those kind of sponsorships. I can go in and lend my privilege to them, thereby giving them opportunities. Whether they're prepared or not, in that case, will be on them. So very, very important to remember. Now, when we start a mentorship relationship, you have to remember also, it's not forever. You don't have to go out with them forever. You can break up with your mentor or your mentee. The best way to do that is to just Time box it. Why are we doing this right now? Are we trying to learn C-sharp or are we trying to get you promoted? Let's figure out what our goal is and make it a sprint. So kind of applying scrum to mentorship. And then of course, remembering, as I said before, that it's a two-way street and not a scheduled regular lecture. Now, as I get towards the end of my, my talk here, I actually have a bunch of fun stories because I think one of the great things about being a person who's been in tech for a long time are the stories. And the great thing about the stories is I've collected them and I want you to collect them as well. People who have been in tech for a long time are filled with wonderful stories. And the first thing I'm gonna start with is a reminder that uh, Swiss Army knives are actually super useful. Uh, my dad gave me a Swiss Army knife when I was 12, and he said it's not a very good tool for anything, but it's got a lot of tools on it. And I realized that I'm kind of a tool myself, and I've got a bunch of different things that I'm not very good at. You know, I'm a pretty good knife, but everything else, I'm a lousy pair of scissors. This is what's called the T-shaped developer. Imagine the shape of a T. You're very broad, somewhat not very deep, but you, you understand fundamentals, and then you go deep, like the 
this the uh, the the top part of the, the bottom part of the T there. So you say, I'm going to go wide. I understand computer science. I understand CPUs. And I understand, you know, algorithms. And I'm going to go deep on Kubernetes or deep on Python or deep on C sharp. But I'm focusing on not being a lousy knife. You got to be a good knife. You can't skimp on the basics. So a lot of my stories relate to those fundamental computer science concepts that aren't technology specific. Usually they break down in terms of problem solving, layering, composition and pattern. So I'll tell you a couple of these. Problem solving is a great one. What's the difference between an early career engineer and a late in career engineer? It's literally the ability to ask yes, no questions at scale. That's all it is. So I was giving a presentation at Black Girls Code and I was talking to a bunch of 14 year old kids. I think they're maybe uh, either freshmen or, or, or eighth graders. And they're all excited to hear uh, from this random old person who's going to talk to them about uh, Microsoft. And hey, let's learn how to program everybody. And I showed up and I said, all right, kids, my toaster's broken. And I just made it super cringe, very awkward. Just sat there with the kids and go, hey, my toaster's broken. What am I going to do about it? I thought we were going to program. Yeah, but I need my toast. So people start making guesses. They start making kind of simple guesses. Well, you should probably buy a new toaster. Valid. Valid. Maybe not the best debugging solution, right? Uh, buy a new toaster. But I said, let's try to think a little bit outside the box. Like this toaster isn't alone in the world. It exists in a system. Let's try to apply not simple thinking, but rather systems thinking. And I paused, made it super awkward. And then one of the young ladies says, what well, is the power on? And I said, there you go. The power is not on. How am I going to fix that? And they said, well, could you plug in something else, like a lamp, and see if the lamp turns on? And I said, that's a great idea. And they start thinking outside the box. Well, you know, what about the fuse? There's a fuse thing in the garage, right? Okay, now we're thinking about the system that the toaster exists in. And then they start talking to each other. Well, hang on, is the power on at all? And then this is where the breakthrough happened. And this is where you know you have a programmer. You've got a programmer who came built in as a kid, as a programmer. Young lady says, do the neighbors have power? Think about that for a second. I asked about toast. I said, I want some toast. And she says, I'm looking out the window and I want to know if the neighbor's lights are on. That's a system thinker. That's a person who's trying to understand how everything works. Because for some folks, the wire comes into the house and a miracle happens and toast appears. But for others, they know that there's a maybe a hydroelectric power plant and the river is rushing through it and it's generating power and it moves through wires all the way in into your miracle toast. And then, of course, at this point, because they're young kids, it all falls apart and they're asking about maybe there was an EMP or aliens have taken over and the power is out for the entire neighborhood. But the, but the point was still made, which is important. So for your early in career folks, uh, they Google a lot for stuff. Sometimes they Google with Bing. And the later folks, they'll just eliminate an entire class of problems. They'll eliminate an entire class of problems just by asking the right question. So as an experiment, I went and I wrote down a bunch of questions that might help one debug a, um, uh, a web application. Just made them up. Just literally picked them. And I just wrote a whole list here. Uh, you know, IP addresses, SSL certificates, um, environment variables. These are all guesses about what could be wrong. And I realized that I could probably do this for pages, five or 600 questions. Did you check this? Did you look at the logs? Did you look at the branch? All these different things. Or as our great American president, uh, Abraham Lincoln said once, it's always DNS. It's always DNS. These are the kind of questions that, how did I collect that list? The way I collected that list is by being in tech for a long time. You can't learn this stuff. You have to live this stuff. But in order to live it, you have to stick in tech and you have to be given the opportunity to fail in a comfortable way with a team that allows you to screw up and not take down production, but still make these mistakes. Everybody's got a story about one of these things. So it's the, it's the uh, applying of your training, of your courses, of your certifications to something in reality. We don't expect you to know this list. We expect you to think about, well, is it the fuse? You know, I don't know. It might be this. It might be that. Those are the kind of questions. Now, my kids insisted that I add this one here. It's never twins. 
Sherlock Holmes. This is a, actually a debugging thing. You know, Sherlock Holmes uh, is trying to find a murderer. This, uh, this, this young bride has killed her husband. But then she was also seen on the other side of town. And Watson says, well, it must be twins. That's how she has an alibi. Could it have been twins? No, it's never twins. There's certain things that it's just never that thing. And you can only learn those things by being in tech for a long time. We'll touch on layering a little bit as we get towards the end here. Hiding complexity in software is layering things on top of each other. And layering is actually a lie. Layering is just lying. A really good abstraction layer lies really, really well. For example, here's uh, what e an email looks like. We've all sent email. We've all attached a file. We don't really think about it. But if you flip that over, imagine just r flipping it over and looking at the text underneath it. You see that we have from colon name to colon name. It's name value pairs. Name colon value. Then we've got this multi-part thing here in pink, but it's basically a, it looks like a hash table. Name value, name value. So let's look at an HTML form. Isn't that interesting? Name value, name value. Did you know that an HTML form and an email are using the same underlying technologies? Most of the stuff that is new and interesting that you think is new and exciting are the same Lego pieces snapped together in a different way. You know this stuff already. A lot of great stuff happening in the Lego space right now, but ultimately the stuff they're building are using the same elements that they made 50 years ago. You, new, uh, new ideas are just reused old ideas. On the uh, right here, we have a, a Victrola, a record player, with audio encoded in a circle with a head. The data is in a circle and it spins. On the left, we have a hard drive with data encoded in a circle and it spins. These are 150 years uh, separated from each other and the same idea is fundamentally there. When we start taking these things and plugging them together, we can compose them in really interesting ways. Here's my last story. I got a buddy of mine who's on a show called Altered Carbon. Altered Carbon is this show, uh, and in the case uh, of my friend Chris, he plays an AI, and the artificial intelligence is a hotel concierge. So he is the hotel, and the hotel is him. So he lives in the hotel, he is the hotel. And he just chews up the scenery. He's amazing, he's just unreal. And uh, so I, I, I tweet, I tweeted the guy because I always like supporting kind of that supporting actor because, you know, the famous people aren't going to answer you, but the mid-level people are be like, hey, you did a great job on Alter Carbon. And he's like, yeah, thanks. And I noticed he was in Portland. So I said, I'm in Portland. I said, let's have tacos. So we go and we hang out. We go and we hang out. He shows up in a vest with an ascot. That's the level of cool I can only aspire to. I'm here cheesing, and this guy comes in with a freaking ascot. Uh, it looks like a million bucks. And we do a podcast, and he's just a sweetheart of a guy. And I'm loving this, and I'm like, oh, this is good. I've got this burgeoning romance uh, with this uh, with this cool person. I'm telling my wife, I'm going to go hang out with uh, the guy from Alter Carbon. And we do a podcast, and it's amazing, and I have my portable recorder, and it's so fun. And then uh, I go home with the little SD card, and I plug the SD card into my, my machine, and there's nothing. There is a recursive, empty folder with another folder inside it with another folder with another folder another folder and i felt physically ill i felt it in my chest i'm like do i do i call this famous actor now and tell him that that we need to do it again hey you remember that lightning in a bottle that we caught uh can we catch that again that would be ever so great i thought i was gonna die do i just ghost him right i'm, I'm working on a bromance here like i thought i got a new friend this is gonna be great so I'm like, the only solution is to go and dig deeper into the layers. So I take a look at the files on the SD card and I notice that there's 300 megs of, of used space. Well, that's interesting. That's, that's not the same as a bunch of empty files. So I start learning. I'm not a low level programmer. I don't know about file allocation tables, but I know that there's documentation and I can start digging around. So I take a dump of all of the bytes on the disk. You know, when you make like an array, when you're learning computer science, and you have a array of numbers. 
all an SD card is an array of numbers that's really long. So I ended up with a 300 megabyte image file of the SD card because I didn't want to break the SD card. And I start looking at it and reading the docs and trying to understand what's going on and learning about hex. And after about 17 hours of reading and learning and reading and learning, I pull the files out and I discover the files. I don't know any. I'm a web developer. I, I live here. I live up here because these layers work. I don't worry about these layers, but those layers exist and I know they exist. So I can just dig deeper. Some of you might be .NET programmers or ASP.NET programmers. You might be a Django programmer. I don't know where you operate, but whatever you're sitting on top of, the stuff underneath is not hidden from you. You do not have to worry about that. You can just dig deeper. Nothing in the computer is hidden from you. And then once you see those things, now you're becoming an elder programmer. You say, hey, I've seen that before. That's all it is. I've seen that before. One last story. One last story. Then I got to go. Okay. I had this file I was trying to compile for a Raspberry Pi, which is a little tiny device, and I copied the file onto the Raspberry Pi, and it wouldn't work. And it kept crashing. And it worked on my machine, but it didn't work in the Raspberry Pi. So I took the two files, and I put them next to each other. And I said, here's the good file, and here's the bad file. And I noticed over here in the good... I had these zero Ds, but if I looked at the bad file, there was just an empty space where zero D should be. How would I solve something like that? What's going on? You can't Google your way out of a problem like this. I start digging around and I discover that the FTP program that I'm using has a setting that says it'll treat a file without extensions as ASCII, as text. So why does that matter? Why does that matter? Well, it matters because 0D means carriage return. So I figured the problem out. I was transferring this file as text, and I went and I told one of the young people in my, uh, at my company about it, and they said, interesting, carriage return, huh? What's a carriage and where is it returning? I said, oh my goodness. And I ran over here to get my Lego typewriter and I said, well, it's 2022, and, you know, when you commit things to Git, you have to think about carriage turns and line feeds and stuff. Here's a carriage. The carriage carries the paper, and the line feed feeds the line. So when you are typing on your Lego typewriter, and it moves the carriage at the end of the line, it goes ding, and it comes all the way back, and that's a carriage return. So that's the code for a carriage return. But I don't use typewriters. I've never seen a typewriter. Yeah, but a typewriter affected why that code exists. And now it's in Git, and now it's on Windows, and it's different between Windows and Linux and Windows and Mac. And this is a thing. And how would you know? You couldn't know. You'd have to see it. But now you know. And the next time, watch this. You know how when you learn a new word, and then you've never heard this word. You lived 30 years on this planet. You've never learned this word. Then you hear it three times in a week. You're going to see a 13 or a 10 or a 0D or a 0A at work tomorrow, or you're going to think about carriage return line feeds changing in Git, and you're going to go, well, did you know that the typewriter, blah, 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 blah. And then you're going to sound like an, uh, an elder programmer, and you're going to share those stories with the, uh, with the young people at your company. All of this is just to tell you that I am very, very glad that you're here, that you're joining us today, whether you've joined Pluralsight and the friends here at uh, Tech Days to learn more or to sharpen the saw, whether you're early in career and you're just getting started or whether you're just trying to get that big promotion, we appreciate that you're here. And I thank you very much for hanging out and I'll turn it over to our hosts for the rest of the day. All right. That was awesome. That story about the podcast recording had my heart racing. It, it's still racing, if I'm being honest. <laughs> what I really loved about that talk is the emphasis on problem solving through practice. And what I mean by that is this idea that, you know, what might seem like genius to you when you are new, when you are just starting to learn, it's it's attainable, you know? It's attainable because you, over time, over 
trying things, trying to build, uh, you can absolutely, absolutely build that muscle. You can start to, you can start to recognize those patterns and over time you start to get faster and faster and figure out those, those questions to ask. Love that. Love it. So uh, we are, we're back. We are gonna move straight into our second keynote of the day. Very excited to, to share this one with you as well. So next up, we are gonna hear from Forrest Brazil. Uh, he's a cloud educator, an author, and a Pony award-winning songwriter who is currently Google Cloud's head of content. He is often called the Tom Lehrer of the cloud. He specializes in using music, humor, and creative illustrations to make technical topics memorable and engaging. So Forrest, was previously an AWS serverless hero and is the creator of Cloud Resume Challenge, uh, which has helped thousands of career changers and upskillers take their first steps into the cloud. We're gonna talk a little bit more about that, a lot, a lot more about that in this next talk, Beyond the Cert, how to build projects that get you hired in cloud. Again, one of the things that I'm really excited about here is this is so actionable. You're gonna get some steps that you can take, that you can start taking now to move forward in your career, especially if you're looking to get into cloud. Uh, and so I encourage you to really keep these tips in mind, keep these steps in mind, and absolutely, absolutely check out the Cloud Resume Challenge. Uh, but keep that in mind, even today, as you're listening through the talks, if you're, especially if you're choosing to go through the cloud track. Uh, so this next talk, how to build projects to get you hired in cloud, we're going to talk through how to, like I said, get beyond the cert. Uh, it is going to be packed with real stories, real world lessons, um, shared from the Cloud Resume Challenge community. And that will help you hopefully close the gap between getting your first certification and getting your first job. So whatever your background, you'll be able to bring really valuable skills to the table and leave this talk inspired to really take those skills to the next level. So with that, I'm gonna lead you into Beyond the Cert how to build projects that get you hired in cloud by Forrest Brazil. Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. It's wonderful to be here with you today. My name is Forrest Brazil, and I'll tell you a little more about myself in a minute. But first, I want to introduce you to someone much more interesting. His name is Daniel Singletary. I met Daniel a couple of years ago, kind of right in the beginning parts of the pandemic. Uh, Daniel at that time was a residential and commercial plumber working in Metro Atlanta. And uh, his job was about what you think a plumber's job is. It was long days, he was on his feet a lot, and he dealt with the kinds of things you might imagine a plumber deals with. He also dealt with some things you might not imagine that a plumber deals with. I'll give you an example. Uh, one day, around the time I met him, Daniel was called out to a shopping mall, a suburban shopping strip near Atlanta, because the owners had reported a mysterious and really noxious smell flowing through the building. All right, maybe something that a plumber might be expected to deal with. So Daniel shows up, he starts looking through the building, he can definitely identify the smell, falls into the bathrooms, eventually takes one of the toilets off the floor, and that's where he gets hit with a blast of stinking air. He described it to me as, imagine a leaf blower blowing sewer gas in your face. Now, I'm not a plumber, but uh, Daniel assures me that not only is this not something that should happen, it shouldn't even be possible. You shouldn't have moving air flowing through a sewer duct like that. So, begs the question, what's going on? Daniel comes back to the shopping mall with a colleague, and they start systematically working at opposite ends, trying every fixture, see if this is where the air is escaping, and they can't find anything. Remember, 
This is an active shopping mall. You can't just you know shut down all the plumbing while you figure out what's going on. So they've got to take it fixture by fixture. Eventually they meet in the middle and they've narrowed the problem down to either a nail salon or a restaurant. One of these two places is what's causing the problem. And that's where they stopped. At this point, only thing left to do is what we call a smoke test. Now, if you've been in software, you may have heard the concept of smoke testing, uh, but this is a literal smoke test. They took a smoke bomb up onto the roof, dropped it down a vent. And the idea is anywhere that this stinky smell could be escaping, well, smoke can also escape, but the only difference is smoke is something you can see with a flashlight. And uh, that cleared up the problem in pretty short order. Turns out that someone had tied the restaurant's uh, commercial kitchen stove, tied the vent hood for that into the sewer system, and that was what was forcing the air through. Well, I think that's one of those problems where maybe when you finish it, you don't actually feel any better when you solve it. Uh, and it was around that time. I'm not saying this is what caused Daniel to make the decision. He wanted a new career, but he, he did decide he wanted to work in a job where maybe he could decide what to smell. Now, Daniel's roommate at the time was in IT, and his roommate recommended something to Daniel called the Cloud Resume Challenge, which is a project I had put out on social media around that time, trying to encourage more people to get into a cloud career by getting hands-on building something with cloud services. And if you've seen the Cloud Resume Challenge floating around on social media, on people's LinkedIn or whatever, you've probably seen these diagrams that they share showing what they built. And imagine being Daniel and seeing this, you know, with zero exposure to tech and reading like API requests, static website, pass requests, a Lambda function. You know, what does that even mean? You'd think that would be uh, just gibberish. Uh, but Daniel actually told me something really interesting. He said when he looked at these diagrams for the first time, he said it looked familiar to him. So he went out and he bought a whiteboard. This is a real picture of Daniel's whiteboard. He sent it to me. And this is his first attempt to make sense of what's going on under the hood of the Cloud Resume Challenge. Daniel called what he had drawn an engineered print because that's what they call it in the trades. He didn't realize he was drawing his very first cloud architecture diagram. Daniel spent the next several weeks learning Python and JavaScript, figuring out how to sling YAML, and how to stitch together cloud services to build a website. And in just a few weeks, his website was online, uh, hosting his resume. This is actually still online today. You can check it out at dsresume.com. Uh, it's maybe not the prettiest thing in the world, right? I'm sure he wouldn't claim to be a front-end developer, but he did it. He built it end-to-end, -end, full stack, and got it online. And I just, I love, I love the certifications that he has listed there. Check this out. Maybe the greatest set of certifications I've ever seen for an entry-level person in tech. Daniel is certified in plumbing. He's a licensed journeyman plumber. He's certified in backflow prevention and cross-connection control inspecting, and he's certified on AWS. I thought that was fantastic. Daniel told a little of his story um, a few weeks later in a blog post called A Plumber's Guide to Cloud. This is the final step of the Cloud Resume Challenge, by the way. You have to blog about what you've done. It's one of the most important steps. And in that, he reflected a little bit on why the Cloud Resume Challenge felt familiar to him, why it felt like something that he was able to tackle and succeed with. And these are quotes from his blog. He, he said, problems are not always going to present themselves in an easy to understand way, whether you're dealing with a bizarre error that keeps coming back to your browser or whether you're dealing with a strange smell that keeps blowing through a building. He said, we tested our setup talking about the uh, issue in the shopping mall at multiple entry points and narrowed down our search using outside the box thinking. In a way, it was almost like pair programming. He worked with a colleague, they tested different points, they had to test them one by one, they narrowed the problem down. It's, it's troubleshooting 101, right? It's the same thing you do if you're trying to figure out a problem in a piece of software. And he was very familiar with that type of work. Obviously, wasn't easily frustrated by that. He was used to slowly iterating his way toward a solution, eliminating possibilities. And then he said, and I love this, even if you can't find the problem, you can't take downtime whenever you want to fix it. Your client or customer base comes first. That is production engineering thinking right there. I don't care if you're working uh, on plumbing in a shopping mall or if you're working with a database. If there's people that depend on it, you have to take them into consideration. You can't just start turning things off to fix the problem. Okay, I've met people that come out of computer science college programs that don't understand that. Something you kind of have to learn on the job. Well, Daniel had been on the job and Daniel had learned that. Daniel's blog post, A Plumber's Guide to Cloud, went viral on LinkedIn. It was viewed more than 200,000 times. And it was only a month or two later, in September of 2020, that he was able to start his new career as a DevOps engineer. And from what I understand, he's still crushing it today. Daniel's story is inspiring, but it's not the only story of people using cloud projects to change their careers. 
and I'm going to tell you a few more of them today. My name is Forrest Brazil. I'm the head of content at Google Cloud. I actually used to work uh, right here at Pluralsight, uh, at A Cloud Guru, which is now a Pluralsight company. So I'm really passionate about helping people change their careers, transition into tech, transition into cloud. Um, I am the creator of the Cloud Resume Challenge. You can learn more about that at ForrestBrazil.com um, or on my Twitter at Forrest Brazil. And I do have a book that's available in stores everywhere and from Wiley Publishing called The Read Aloud Cloud, which is kind of a friendly general audience's introduction to cloud computing. And it is heavily illustrated with cartoons. And fair warning, there may be a few cartoons in this talk, as there usually are in a talk of mine. So today we're going to be talking about how to go beyond certifications, how to get into a cloud career uh, or advance your cloud career through building projects, kind of like the one we just described. And we'll be very clear up front. I'm not down on certifications. I'm not dissing certifications. Obviously, I used to work at a cloud guru. I have several cloud certs. I believe passionately in their importance. And there's... Uh, uh, it feels like you know consulting where certs actually do take on outsized importance. But I mean, let's be real. There's kind of a disconnect right now in tech where, look, you can make a lot of money in cloud, okay? It's a fantastically lucrative career. You get to work on interesting problems. But it sometimes seems like we've got one line for you know people that are trying to hire experienced cloud engineers, and there's nobody in that line. And we've got another line of people that really want to get started, and there's nobody looking to hire them. The supply and demand is way off. And so you may have ended up in a situation where, you know, you've walked into a job interview and you do have a couple of certs, but you get slapped down by a hiring manager or even by a recruiter saying, oh, yeah, well, that's great, you know, but come back to us when you get some more on the job experience. How? It's chicken or the egg. How am I going to get experience without a job? All right. That's where projects come in. And I want to say, again, certs. They're great. They're a great way to get started. Uh, you definitely need to have some, I think, if you're coming to tech, coming to cloud from a, a non-technical background. It's a really good foundational way to get started. But there are some diminishing returns. If you're going to get you know, cert after cert after cert and not be able to show that you have that kind of production engineering experience like we talked about with Daniel. Uh, so a, a small non-zero number of core certifications mixed with hands-on projects, in my experience, tends to be a better, more solid thing to walk into an interview with. We're going to talk a lot about projects over the next little bit. I'm going to share some things I've learned from the Cloud Resume Challenge community that make a good project, that make a winning project, a project that stands out in a job interview. But I want to start off by mentioning that not all projects are created equal. Okay, And so if you've been struggling or you've been having trouble getting people to notice or take attention of your projects or maybe even take them seriously, it might be one of these things. I'm not saying it is, but these are things that I've seen frequently be a problem for people. Uh, like Hello World level tutorials, you know, where you kind of follow a series of steps someone lays out and just kind of copy and paste the commands they give you to build something that was preordained from the beginning of the project. Those are great for learning. You should absolutely do them, but they tend to not be that great for your resume because, again, like you didn't really build anything on your own. You kind of just followed a recipe that someone else laid out. There's not a whole lot of problems that will present themselves to you in an actual job that will be quite that straight forward. So those are kind of hard to list on your resume. Uh, home automation. And don't get upset with me here. I mean, we all love like, you know, uh, programming our lights and things like that. We love dragging out a Raspberry Pi and figuring out how to control our sprinklers. But uh, the reality is, unless it's some really awesome and specific job that I haven't heard of, uh, your hiring manager probably isn't going to need you to program their sprinklers. So the DIY consumer home automation stuff, while they're fun projects and great to do, and you may learn a lot doing them, they don't always land well in a job interview because they just don't always seem like they translate. And then the last thing I'll bring up, I'm calling them intentionally bad ideas. I'm being deliberately a little bit vague there, but uh, it's kind of hard to take into a job interview something where um, you've built something that's intentionally overcomplicated, where you've maybe pulled in a bunch of, I don't know, cloud services, or you've used a programming language that you would never use that way in reality. Maybe you've, I don't know, run a website on a fleet of Raspberry Pis just because you could. But hey, just because you can doesn't necessarily mean that you should. Um, and so if you're building a project that you're going to put on your resume and take into an interview, you want it to be something that actually looks appreciably like someone, something someone might build if you paid them to build it. Okay. So, that may feel a little bit negative. I just listed off a bunch of things not to do. Now we're going to spend the majority of our time focusing on what does work and what does make a really good cloud project. And there's three big things I'm going to call out for projects that win. And the first thing is make it useful. And you might think that goes without saying, right? I mean, anything you build should be useful. That, that seems obvious. But I find that it's not always quite as obvious because, especially if you're coming into cloud from a completely non-technical background, how do you know what a useful project is, right? You have no professional grounding or experience to say, okay, I mean, is this something that someone would actually use or is this just a toy project? It's sometimes really hard to have that discernment. 
And here's how I would recommend approaching that if you're not sure. So if you're not totally coming from a, a non-technical background, let's say you're working in IT today in some capacity, and you'd like to make that jump to cloud engineering or being a DevOps engineer, but you just you don't have the hands-on experience with cloud, I would recommend taking some things that you're already doing in your IT career and figuring out how to, if I can coin a word, cloudify them. All right. Uh, you may feel like your IT career is something you're rebuilding in flight, and that's okay. Here's how I would say you rebuild that. How to cloudify a skill. First thing, build the thing you know. So let's say that, like I used to be at one point in my career, you're a SQL Server database administrator, and you're trying to figure out how to get to the cloud. First thing I would do, take a SQL Server and just stand it up. I say Google Cloud because I, I work for Google Cloud, so I have to kind of smuggle in a little bit of a... a pitch here. But uh, let's say you're, you're just going to go to Google Cloud and, and stand up a SQL Server there. I'm not saying use any of the managed services. I'm saying go get a SQL Server, just put it on the most basic VM you can find, click around in the console, and just you know, kind of stand back and, and see, okay, I did that. It looked kind of the same as when I did it in the data center. I can connect to it over the right port, you know, and I can still run the same queries that I'm used to running. And that's step one. Second step, I would automate that thing. So where you were using click ops before, clicking around in the console, now you're going to use some sort of automation to get this thing stood up. All right, you're going to write some scripts to make sure that that script, uh, that uh, SQL Server stands up the exact same way every time, initializes the same way. You're going to put your code in source control using something like GitHub. Maybe you're going to build some kind of a rudimentary uh, CI/CD pipeline to make sure that that code gets from your laptop to the cloud without any other manual touches in between. Terraform, Git, that sort of thing are your friends. So that's step two. And then step three, finally, is I want you to reproduce this thing using cloud services. So instead of just standing up the SQL Server yourself on a, a VM, now you're going to say, hey, I wonder if I could use this uh, Google Cloud SQL thing to build any, some equivalent functionality. Or there's this spanner thing over here that's a little different than what I'm used to. I'm less comfortable with it. It doesn't maybe use the drivers that I'm used to, but I can see that it's going to end up with some sort of you know distributed relational database setup. So I'm going to try that and see what the differences are. And now you've kind of scaffolded your knowledge along with the new things that you're learning, and you've probably gotten farther than you would have uh, if you just started you know, trying to learn uh, managed services from scratch. That's how I'd recommend approaching a project if you do have some uh, existing IT knowledge. If you don't, if you're trying to get into cloud or into tech from you know a, a background of, I don't know, being a, a residential plumber, here's how I would recommend going about building your skill stack. All right, and this is where certs come back in, because again, I keep saying it, I'm not anti-cert, I'm not down on certs. I just wanna try to put them into their proper place in the hierarchy. So I would start with a foundational cloud certification. This could be something like the AWS Solutions Architect Associate or Google Cloud's Associate Cloud Engineer, something that gives you a broad spectrum of coverage across the basic services and features that that cloud provider offers. And then I would layer several uh, pieces of knowledge on top of that. You need to know how to code, all right? Code is the barrier to getting a cloud job. Code is also the bridge to getting a cloud job. It's the reason why people that have been software engineers tend to have an easier time getting hired in cloud than people that have been IT admins, because oftentimes being comfortable and fluent with writing code is the difference between those two groups of people. So you're going to need to know how to write code so that you can automate things so that you can manage the cloud at the scale that the cloud requires, right? Servers can't be pets anymore, as we sometimes say in that world. You've got to know how to code. Pick a language. Python's a great one if you haven't uh, chosen one already. Go is another great one. A lot of Google Cloud is written on Go. Uh, Linux and networking. Basic Linux and networking are key things to know. Again, you can do some courses to help you uh, track things down here. You could potentially look at getting like a specialty certification, but I would say don't quite focus on that yet. Just make sure that you basically know the network stack. You understand you know, IP and the various protocols that build on top of it. You understand DNS. And I'm going super fast here because this is not a talk about, you know, what are all the things you need to know in the uh, Linux kernel or the things you need to know in the networking stack. I'm just calling out, these. Are, this is something you want to be comfortable on. It is going to come up in interviews. And then finally, you know, you need to learn how the cloud services fit together. And the way to do that and to tie in these other skills, Linux networking and code, is to bring in hands-on projects. Okay. So I would build a couple projects that encapsulate those things. And then while you're maybe going after, could be a professional level certification or a specialty cert that kind of dials some of this in a little bit more closely, that's when I would start applying for jobs. Let me give you one thing here before we move on to the next point, which is when you walk into a job interview, the reason that you wanna have projects in your back pocket is not necessarily 
because the hiring manager is going to be so impressed by the fact that you built something on your own. They may be. I mean, I've heard many stories of people that, that have gotten jobs that way, but it's ultimately not going to be as impressive as, you know, you having five years of professional experience somewhere. But what working on these projects does do for you is, is just the pain of having, you know, beat your head against various problems for multiple days to be able to figure them out and get them working in real life, that's going to cause those solutions to stick in your head way more than if you just read about them in a book or crammed something for a certification exam. You know, if you dealt with, I don't know, cert validation for a couple of days, try to figure out, uh, you know, how to work through uh, DNS validation to get a cert renewed, you're never going to forget that piece of that, or it's going to stick in your mind a lot better. And so when you get asked about it or asked to tell a story about a time when you did X, Y, or Z in an interview, that story is going to come to mind. You're going to feel much more confident. So feel that pain. You don't have to love the pain. You can even hate the pain, but you will remember the pain if you've experienced it. That's the real power, the hack behind doing these cloud projects. That's what makes them so useful. Second thing, projects that win. Make it useful. Make it accessible. So there's a little bit of a nuanced difference from being useful, to be clear. And I'm not just talking about accessibility in the sense of like, you know, uh, making sure it works with screen readers, although that's super important and you should definitely do that. I'm talking about it even more broadly. I'm talking about accessible in the sense of you want to create a project that people can understand, that resonates with them, where they get why the problem you're solving is something that, you know, is, is something that they can get their heads around. I see a lot of cloud projects out there that they're just sitting out on GitHub and it's kind of some inscrutable scripts and maybe they are solving a super useful problem. Maybe it's exactly the kind of thing that you know, you'd know you be doing on the job, but how many hiring managers are going to sit there and try to read through this and decipher your uncommented code and figure out what it is you actually did, right? Let's be very real and say probably not a lot of people. So it's kind of up to you to package and present that project in a way that clicks with people, that people understand. Uh, this is where full stack engineering can come in handy. You know, putting a front end, putting a dashboard on your project is super important. It's why it's a key part of the cloud resume challenge, even though there's not a lot of cloud engineers that write front end code, okay? Or you know, maybe there are some. I feel like there's a lot of cloud jobs that don't, but it's so important to have that uh, accessible front end interface on it so that other people can understand what you've built and what it's for. If you're not sure how to do this, you're not sure if you're building something that other people can understand, the best way to test that is to bounce it off of other people. And I think that getting plugged into a community is one of the key advantages that products bring you. I'm gonna give you a couple of suggestions here. Number one, get active on Twitter. I know, Twitter's the worst. All right, it's, uh, you know, I pull my hair out on there every other day. But the real advantage of Twitter, especially for people that are early in their careers, is it gives you what I would call an asymmetric level of access to people who are much more influential or much more experienced than you are in the space. You can ask them questions and they will often respond. You can reply to them, you can make comments, you can tag them in things, and it's shocking you know, how often you'll find yourself having a conversation with someone who literally has a Wikipedia page all right, about the amazing things that they've done uh, in tech. It's a amazing kind of leveling of ground to be able to speak with people that you would possibly never be in a physical room with. So check out Twitter, get active there, get plugged in, um, and then join some cloud provider communities. Again, this is where my Google Cloud bias creeps in, so feel free to ignore, but there's a Google Cloud community called Google Cloud Innovators. It's relatively new. It's also relatively straightforward to join the community. You don't have to have a lot of existing credentials to get in there, but it's gonna give you some kind of insider access to a lot of the things that are going on at Google Cloud. And if you're interested in that particular cloud, cloud provider, I would recommend that. And there are similar communities for the other major cloud providers as well. And then finally, I would recommend learning in public, not a concept that's unique to me, uh, but this is just taking the projects you're working on, taking the discoveries you make, and just sharing them as you go along. I'm not saying you have to become some content creator or some influencer or whatever, but Usually the best time to share something, a problem that you've worked on is right after you've solved it, when it's still fresh in your mind. That helps other people recognize that you're going through problems that they're also going through, which will make them want to come be part of what you're working on. And it also helps you remember things, it helps you remember what you learned in the same way that, you know, we wanted you to kind of burn in that pain so that it comes to the front of your mind when you get asked a question in a job interview. Writing up what you learn as you learn it will help cement that for you as well. Believe it or not, as I was putting this talk together, I went back and reviewed a couple of old blog posts that I had written, a couple of old uh, YouTube videos I had recorded because things I had learned about how to make a good project two years ago uh, were not at the top of my mind now. But it turns out that going back and looking at those blogs made it very easy to come back. So I highly recommend kind of creating that breadcrumb trail for yourself of things that you've done. 
I want to talk for a minute, though, here about asking for help, because I get asked a lot about this in the cloud project world, where people say, well, you know, I'm doing something like the cloud resume challenge, and I see there are these steps I'm supposed to accomplish, and I'm not sure how to do them, but I'm also not sure if I should go out on Twitter, or I should go into the cloud resume challenge Discord server, and if I should ask someone, you know, how do I do this? Can you give me a hint? Can you share a piece of code with me? Um, that feels like cheating, right? If I was in school, that would be cheating. Well, here's where I remind you that we are not in school here, all right? We are professionals. We are learning together to do our jobs better. And if you're on the job and working with a coworker and you get stuck, actually a big part of your job skills is in not just spinning your wheels and staring at the screen for days and not making any progress. You're probably going to get in trouble if you do that. Instead, if you get to a point where you feel stuck and you don't know what to try, that's when you pull in a colleague, right? That's when you go to your manager and say, hey, I'm really blocked here. Can you help me get unblocked? There are whole structures in the professional world to do that. And as you're building cloud projects, I would recommend not letting yourself get frustrated and stuck on something that you just can't figure out, but to engage with those communities that can help you figure out how to solve it. Even if it means that they, you know, help you write a line of code. That's okay. Again, this isn't school. We're learning together, all right? And over time, as you actually get closer to people and learn from them, you'll learn faster and better than if you try to do it on your own. So don't feel a stigma about asking for help. Just work to build a community so that you have helpers when you need them. Third thing, make your project useful, make it accessible, and finally, and perhaps most importantly, make it yours. Make it your own. I want to share with you a tweet from Scott Hanselman, who I know is a friend of Plural Sight. Uh, he says, this is it, Tech Twitter. This is the tip, not tutorials. Remember we said Hello World tutorials have limits, right, is, is something that goes on your resume. But make a thing. Register the domain. Get the cert. And to be clear here, he's not talking about getting a certification. He's talking about, you know, getting SSL working on your site. Uh, get an A on security headers. Submit it to a store. Fix SEO at OpenGraph. I've spent so much time with various static sites that I run getting OpenGraph tags to play nice. It's so frustrating. Uh, features. Make a progressive web app. Run a site 24 seven. This is how I know stuff, run real sites and scale them. Scott's been at Microsoft a long time. Um, he's extremely influential in the developer community. He knows what he's talking about here. Uh, so this is a world where you're not just creating a one-off project to solve some contrived problem, but you're creating a website that does something that you need it to do. And I think over time, as you work on a website or a project that has some personal meaning to you, that solves a problem that you actually have in your daily life, you'll be more likely to maintain that site over time, that project over time. You'll be more, more likely to come back to it and add fixes and features, and that's going to keep your learning going. It's going to help you grow as an engineer. So you want to do something that's your own. And this brings us back to the Cloud Resume Challenge. I mentioned it a bit up front. If you're not familiar with it, you can check it out at cloudresumechallenge.dev. It's a free set of steps that basically gets you to deploy your resume in the cloud, and it brings in a bunch of different cloud services behind the scenes to make that happen. You can do it on AWS, on Azure, on Google Cloud. There's separate sets of instructions for each of those. It's kind of a spec-based project. So it doesn't tell you, you know, run this command, run this command, run this command, and then it's going to be done. It just gives you the outcome of the step. Like, hey, uh, I want you to, you know, store your uh, visitor counter in a database. And then you've got to figure out what database you're going to use and how to write the code that actually does that. Uh, so it's, it's quite challenging, particularly if you're new to the industry. Uh, you'll see a lot of uh, you know, Cloud Resume Challenge blog posts floating around out there. I mentioned that's one of the steps of the challenge is to start taking baby steps into the community by sharing about it. Uh, and you'll see a lot of people sharing architecture diagrams. This is a real one from someone who did an AWS version. I just pulled it off of their blog. Uh, and you'll see um, this, this is what's being done behind the scenes here. So there's uh, a front end piece where you know they're deploying to S3. Um, they've got CloudFront, which is a CDN, a content delivery network in front of that. Uh, they've got some DNS going on. Uh, they've got a little CICD workflow behind the scenes that involves GitHub Actions, as well as AWS SAM, which is an infrastructure as code tool built on top of cloud formation. And they've got a little backend piece, right? That's uh, DynamoDB, Lambda, and then what we call API Gateway. And all those things are tied together in one full stack cloud project. It's very cool if you can get this working. But I want you to notice something here. What's shown on this slide is what anybody could produce given the spec that's in the Cloud Resume Challenge. So if you want a great story to tell in a job interview and you want to make the Cloud Resume Challenge part of it, I would recommend going farther than what's shown here. I would recommend finding a way to extend the Cloud Resume Challenge in a way that's unique to you. 
And there's lots of ways you can do this. A couple examples I'll give you. Uh, you could add additional API authentication and rate limiting to it. The uh, standard spec for the Cloud Resume Challenge is, is pretty open in that regard. Um, you could build some monitoring on the back end so that you get pinged when something goes wrong. If that Lambda function stops working, you know, you might want to get an email about that so you can go in and fix it. Uh, you could build out a multi-step CI/CD pipeline that not only has one production environment where your code lives, but also has like a staging environment where you can deploy changes to make sure they work right and build hopefully some automated tests to ensure they work right before you push that change onto production. All these are kind of more mature, uh, you know, cloud architecture practices that you'll see show up on the job. But if you build these things into your own site, and if you maintain that personal site over time, because it's meaningful to you, you'll be able to add more of these things and you'll have more unique stories to tell in a job interview. Like, hey, you know, there was that weird time when my cert expired and my Lambda function stopped working and I got pinged and then I was able to go in and fix it, right? That's that's a great story to tell. And it's something that only happens if you're keeping an eye on this site and maintaining and investing in it over time. Let me leave you with this uh, for this part of our, our conversation. Projects are not just something you do because you're hopeful that they will crack a magic code and give you access to jobs, all right? There's gonna be a lot more to it than that. But one of the things that projects always do is they help you figure out if you enjoyed working on the project or not, all right? You may find yourself discovering that you don't actually like working in cloud as much as you thought that you might. It's actually a really good thing to know before you spend a whole bunch of time, you know, prepping for and interviewing for jobs that you may end up hating, all right? Projects help you figure out what you enjoy. That's a personal value they have to you. And so that's why I highly recommend trying them before you make the big step of making a career change. I always love sharing this tweet, and I promise I'm not doing it to pick on this guy, Cesar. Uh, but this is something that he shared back when I originally announced the Cloud Resume Challenge, uh, right at the beginning of the pandemic, April of 2020. He says, what's the over-under that a person who met your pre-qualifications will actually complete the whole steps? My pre-qualifications, by the way, were that you couldn't have existing background in cloud. I wanted to see people try this from totally non-tech backgrounds. He says one person. He thinks a grand total of one person would be able to do that. And he says, I hope I'm wrong. And I'm happy to say... Uh, I take, you know, no undue pleasure in this, but it does make me happy to say that Cesar was wrong uh, and that thousands of people have attempted the Cloud Resume Challenge. Hundreds have completed it, and we've seen dozens that have actually gone on and leveraged that as key parts of getting hired in cloud. Now, that's a kind of a winnowing down, right, of, of numbers, and that's because it's a difficult project. Uh, you know, and a lot of people try it and realize, oh, this isn't really for me. I didn't really want to do this. Um, but that's good learning, too. Again, that's part of why this is out there. And I'm so excited you know, to have met folks that are in retail, uh, that come from banking, that come from HR, that come from legacy IT careers where they weren't getting to touch the cloud in their daily work, even people who were, you know, commercial plumbers, all folks that have used the Cloud Resume Challenge to find new roles in tech. And I want to finish up kind of tying all this together by telling you about one of my favorite of these side projects, the side project that made the front page. Uh, and we're going to kind of use this as an opportunity to go back through our key points of what makes a good project. We're going to notice how they stand out and what I'm about to show you. Let me introduce you to one more person. His name is Jacob Andre. Jacob was a combat medic during the Iraq War. After the war, he came back to the U.S., uh, got a biology degree. I believe he went on to get a master's degree as well. And he spent several years as an infectious disease researcher at Lurie Children's Hospital in Chicago, working on HIV AIDS, and then eventually, in the very early days of the pandemic, uh, working on COVID-19. In early 2021, Jacob decided that it was time for him to make a career change, that he wanted to become a DevOps engineer. Jacob knew that he wanted to build something useful, all right? He wanted to build something useful. Uh, and the way he went about getting hired in cloud, he got several cloud certifications. Again, not saying they're bad. They're very good. That was the right place for him to start. He did the cloud resume challenge. That's how I got to know him. But he went beyond that a little bit. He was looking for other projects to do. And so he did a project that I had created uh, back when I worked at A Cloud Guru, which is now a Pluralsight company. We had created this set of projects called the Cloud Guru Challenges. And they were kind of spin-offs of the original cloud resume challenge. They used a similar format. And the idea was to see if we could extend this to other types of cloud learning. And so I had created this project called uh, Event Driven Python on AWS, which was an attempt to get you building an ETL pipeline. If you don't know what ETL pipeline is, it's uh, ETL stands for extract, transform, load. And it just means, hey, we're going to take some data from somewhere. We're going to do something to it. We're going to change the way it's formatted somehow. And then we're going to push it off to some other data repository somewhere else. 
Sounds kind of boring on the face of it, but like a huge amount of cloud engineering work or data engineering or DevOps engineering is built around those exact type of problems. We've got some data, we're gonna munge it, we're gonna put it somewhere else. It's just bedrock useful stuff that cloud engineers do all the time. And to make it a little more interesting, the data sets we were using were COVID-19 data sets from Johns Hopkins. So we were looking at daily case counts. And you can see the uh, note from the blog here. You can check this out. It's still live. You can do it yourself today if you want. So Jacob decided to take on this COVID case tracker project. It was interesting to him because he you know, had some clinical background working with COVID-19. And he did. He built it out. But he didn't just build out this project. He decided to make something that was easily accessible to other people that others could look at as well. And so he built a website. It's called cpscovid.com. Again, it's live. You can check it out right now if you want, where he surfaced this daily case data that he was discovering. Uh, I mean, would Jacob tell you he's the greatest front-end developer in the world? I'm, I'm sure he wouldn't make a claim to do that. But it's easy. You can you know actually interact with it. You can see what's going on. You don't have to be a super technical person to appreciate the value of this site. You could be a school teacher. You could be a parent. You could be a hiring manager. And you can easily see that this is something worth doing. So it took him some time, obviously but he was able to put this together. And not only did he make it useful and accessible, Jacob took some steps to make this project his own. He didn't actually use the data sets that I recommended in the project. It was COVID-19 data he was looking at, but if you've been to cpscovid.com, you've probably figured out that the CPS part stands for Chicago Public Schools. Jacob lived in Chicago. He has children in the Chicago Public School System. So he decided to scope down his website to just tracking cases in the Chicago area. And uh, what that did was it enabled him to build something that was personally meaningful to him, something that he wanted to check every morning when getting out of bed and figuring out how to send his kids to school. And that enabled him to keep working on it over time. It won't surprise you to know that Jacob got a DevOps job in pretty short order. I think he's a DevOps engineer at, uh, at Yellow now. But he kept running his site because he built something that had use to him. He was able to keep pushing out updates to it, keep learning, running this on the side. Around the beginning of the new year, so January of 2022, Jacob noticed something strange. See if you can spot it here. This is a graph that he uh, had pulled out of some backend number crunching he did on the site. There's two uh, lines here, the red line and the blue line. And notice the red line is showing the number of cases overall in the district where he was living. And then the blue line is showing cases that were popping up at, in the school system. And those lines basically tracked each other identically right through the end of calendar year 2021. But just after the calendar flipped over to 2022, notice something changed. What changed? Well, the district cases shot way up which should make sense because we hit a huge COVID wave uh, in uh, right around the turn of the year here in the U.S. But the school cases stayed the same. In fact, they actually went down, way down. It didn't look right to Jacob. So he kept digging, poking around in the data, and he eventually came to the conclusion that, well, he couldn't say exactly why it was happening, but he believed that the Chicago public school system had actually changed the way they were reporting data to make it look like COVID was not as prevalent in the schools as it was. And, you know, Again, can only make assumptions, but this happened to be at the same time that the Chicago uh, school administrators were in a deathly fight with the teachers union over going back to in-person learning. So you could start to construct some ideas about why this might have been happening. Jacob took to Twitter through his CPS COVID account to share a thread about how Chicago public schools has been, in his view, intentionally deceiving parents and the public about COVID numbers. And he brought receipts. If you go down through that thread, it's just an endless series of screenshots from his dashboard showing how the numbers pretty clearly were being fudged. Well, before long, Jacob's story was everywhere. Newsweek picked it up, Chicago Sun-Times. Uh, the Chicago public schools were compelled to respond after the aldermen in the city began raising concerns about it, saying that, well, they didn't intentionally mislead people, but they couldn't argue with Jacob's data. It was pretty clear that they had changed the way they were doing the reporting. Uh, Jacob went on national news uh, asking for an apology over the misleading data. And while Chicago public schools never admitted to intentionally changing what they were doing to mislead, I will say they're not able to mislead parents in the Chicago area anymore because every news outlet in Chicago ran screenshots from Jacob's dashboard. Let's step back a second. Remember, Jacob wasn't just a cloud engineer. He had significant background in clinical research training. And those two things combined helped him to spot a public health issue that nobody else had noticed. Think about Daniel Singletary, who we started with. His background in the trades, his production engineering experience, if you will, combined with his cloud jobs to make him an operations superstar. So that brings it back to you. What's your superpower? What's your unique, what's your unique combo of skills? What have you done in the past? Where have you worked? that you can combine with cloud to not only level up your own career, but potentially 
have some impact on society? These are questions you can answer through a cloud project. These are questions that can guide you to the right next step in your career. So I want you to sit and think for a minute, how can you put that combination of skills in practice today? I truly believe that the world needs you. The world needs the skills that you bring, the value that you provide. All right. And cloud projects are a great way to start with that. I can't wait to see what you're going to do. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen today. Again, my name is Forrest Brazil. I share lots of these stories about cloud projects on my Twitter at Forrest Brazil. You can follow me there. Um, and then if you're interested in trying the cloud resume challenge or any of those other cloud guru challenges that I mentioned, they're all linked at cloudresumechallenge.dev. They're free. You can try them today. And I hope that you will. Thank you so much. So many thank yous to both of our keynote speakers, Scott Hanselman and Forrest Brazil are both absolutely incredible educators. I feel really, really fortunate that I'm able to learn from both of them and that we were able to bring them into this event to share their experience and their advice. Uh, I am also really happy to have my colleagues, Lars Clint and Jeremy Morgan joining me. Hello. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> so I, before we transition into the tracks, I want to add to something that Scott said about mentoring and y'all jump in with me if you have opinions, but I wanted to add that you don't need to have a formal relationship with somebody to benefit from their knowledge and from their experience. When you find people that you admire who are doing things that you want to do, listen to them, read what they write, try the practices that they advocate, explore the communities that they love. And, you know, like Forrest said, get active on Twitter, that kind of thing. Um, having, having those kind of connections in, in public can be huge. Yeah, right. absolutely. I, I actually make a list of a lot of the people that I, that I follow online and I follow their career and things. I kind of make a list of things like this is something that they did really well that I really like. And then I also make a list of these are some things that work well, but I don't think would work well for me. Like just knowing my personality and how I work, you know, I'm like this, this works well for this person, but not so much for me. And then I, I keep, you know, a list of the things that I think work well, like, oh, this, this particular presentation style is really cool. I might try to adopt that or or whatever. And, and you can absolutely do that. Like you said, without any kind of a uh, personal relationship, you can, you can just watch what they do and, and emulate what you like and, and no, don't emulate the things that, that won't work for you. So. I just copied Jeremy's lists. <laughs> <laughs> it's good to have a Jeremy in your corner for sure. <laughs> uh, right. But yeah, well, if y'all wouldn't mind. Uh, so Lars, you're going to be guiding folks through the cloud skills track. Jeremy is going to be hosting the developer skills track. Um, I've had the privilege to welcome folks into Tech Skills Day, talk us through the keynotes. Uh, and I'm really looking forward to meeting folks and talking with hopefully many of you folks in the Plural Slate community as I grow into my new role here. Um, but Lars, Jeremy, if you wouldn't mind introducing yourselves. Oh yeah, good plan. We should do that. Um, so, hi everybody. I'm Lars, and um, I am. I'm in Australia. I know. So uh, yeah, it's it's like I don't know what is it like 4:20 a.m. or something here. But that's okay because I'm here with all you guys. Um, so <laughs> this is what I do. I enjoy it. I love it. Uh, so I'm Lars Clint. I'm a pure site. Oh God, what's my title now? A developer evangelist. I think that's what we're called now. It doesn't matter. We help all the learners do all the things um, that that you know you want to do. Really. We're just here to sort of guide you and help you. But I'm a Microsoft MVP. I do live in Australia, in rural Australia of all places. Um, so I'm going to preface this, say, hey, I'm on Starlink. If I drop out, it's Elon's fault. Can we do that? Is that fair? Yeah. Yeah, let's, do let's that. go with it. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, I, uh, I've i been doing this forever. I love these live streams, and I love this sort of interaction with the actual learners. So put all your things in the chat, right, wherever you are. If you've got questions or whatever, put them in the chat and Matthias will answer them probably, but, you know, some of us will answer them. <laughs> um, but, yeah, I think that's enough waffling for me. I'm just going to pass it over to Jeremy, who has way better hair than me. <laughs> Thanks, Lars. So I'm Jeremy Morgan. I'm a developer ad advocate for Pluralsight. Um, and I am outside of Portland, Oregon. I'm also in a rural area, but I'm, I'm outside of Portland, Oregon. So if you guess that it's raining outside right now, you'd be absolutely correct. 
Um, so I'm a senior developer evangelist. Uh, I like to call myself the world's okayest developer, and I love helping developers get better at what they do. Um, so I, I love what I do every day, and the Tech Skills Day is such a huge part of that. And um, so I'll be doing the developer track. And what we're going to do um, is jump into a 10-minute break, and then we're going to get started on the developer side. So yeah, join us. I did. Join us, yeah. As Lars said, jump in the chat. We will chat with you and uh, this be a fun, interactive hangout situation. <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> All right. See you soon. <laughs>
Good were those keynotes, like Jeebus. I especially like the part where Forrest said, do your project. Like It's just such an important part of anything in technology, I think, is that sort of tinkering and that having that passion for sort of going, oh, this is really cool, but also making it useful. So um, if you have followed my journey, you might know that I've done something called Llama Cam. That was one of my projects to try and figure out how a service works on Azure. So, yeah, get into those projects if you haven't already. Um, it's just fun. Like if you find something that you really want that's enjoyable that can actually help you further on. So, um, but I am not here to talk about me. Well, not much. Um, I'm here to uh, introduce our first speaker on the cloud track. So you are now on the cloud track. There's also the developer track with Jeremy, but that he's hosting. But the cloud track, and our first speaker is Keisha Williams, and um, she's an award-winning software engineer and technology leader with a passion for hands-on building and developing the next generation of leaders. Now, I'm reading this, but it's very true. Keisha is an incredible leader, community builder. Like I've worked with her at ACG when we were there, and now she's at Slalom. Um, she's a recognized as a, she's an AWS machine learning hero. She's an election champion. She's a hacker rank all-star. Like the list just goes on and on and on. Like you can't have enough Keisha. It's fantastic. Um, she is currently the senior principal at Slalom in the AWS Clouds, res if I could speak, the AWS Cloud Residency. And her talk today is about launching your startup using something called AWS Amplify. So without me waffling anymore, here is Keisha Williams, and I'll be back with you after. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Tech Skills Day. My name is Keisha Williams, and I'll be talking to you about launching your startup using AWS Amplify. I currently serve as a senior principal at Slalom in the AWS Cloud Residency Program, and I'm super thrilled to be here with you today. What are we going to talk about today? I'll tell you a little bit about my journey in tech, I'll give you a brief introduction to AWS Amplify. We'll look at the architecture of my application salary overflow that I built using Amplify. We'll talk through my development process. I'll give you a quick demo. We'll look at some of my lessons learned, and then we'll talk about your next steps. Before we get started, let me tell you a little bit about my technology journey. I started coding basic in high school. Now that probably dates me because that was a pretty long time ago. I soon progressed to active server pages, active X controls and BB script building web applications. If you're familiar with those technologies, they're the precursor to .NET. I was then introduced to Java, and the rest is history. Java basically sustained most of my career. About seven years ago, I was introduced to AWS and the cloud. And about three years ago, I was introduced to machine learning, bringing us to 26 years later. So that's a little bit about me. Now let's jump right in with AWS Amplify. What is Amplify? Well, I can tell you it's becoming one of my favorite services. It allows you to quickly build full stack web applications on AWS with low code. Amplify has an integration with AppSync, allowing you to create GraphQL APIs, it also integrates nicely with Amazon Cognito, building the baseline for user authentication and authorization in your web application. 
And you know, that's a very important part of any web app. And sometimes the challenging piece to set up. Well, out of the box, AWS Amplify provides this functionality. It also has direct integration with databases. Now let me tell you a little bit about my app, which I call Salary Overflow. Now when you hear the term Salary Overflow, think Stack Overflow, but for salaries. And I actually use AWS Amplify to build the MVP version of my application in under two weeks. Like Amplify is so amazing. The goal of Salary Overflow is to close the gender pay gap in tech and to bring transparency to tech salaries. Now let's look at some of the functionality in the MVP. You're able to enter your salary, you're able to view existing salaries, and you're able to filter the data by gender, title, location, currency, salary, and years of experience. Now let's look at the architecture of Salary Overflow. On the front end, I'm using React. And let me let you in on a little secret. I also use Salary Overflow as a way to learn and experiment with new technologies. So this was my first time using React. And I can tell you after my experience, I am totally sold on React. No more Angular front end development for me. <laughs> As far as hosting and distribution of that static front end, so the static files like HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, I'm using a combination of CloudFront and S3. S3 serves as the origin, basically means it's hosting, it's where I store all of my static files, and then CloudFront is that content delivery network that serves up my content globally. For authentication and authorization, I'm using Amazon Cognito. And like I mentioned, there is a nice integration where Amplify sets up my Cognito user pools for me, saving me a lot of time. Now let's look at the back end. I mentioned I'm using AWS AppSync and GraphQL APIs. I'll let you in on another secret. This was my first time using GraphQL. I typically use REST APIs in the past. And there again, I can tell you, I am totally sold on GraphQL. And I'll talk more about why in the lessons learned section. On the back end, I also use Amazon Aurora. Again, my first time, I typically used RDS in the past. And AWS Lambda. So there's a Lambda function that whenever a new user signs up, enters that record in the database. And for analytics, I'm using Amazon Pinpoint. And another neat thing that's not featured on this slide is out of the box, Amplify comes with a CI CD pipeline set up for you. Now let's talk about my development process and really the order that I needed to create things for AWS Amplify to work. So first I needed a database and I considered DynamoDB, which is the NoSQL non-relational database versus MySQL. And what I realized my data did have relationships. So DynamoDB wasn't the best choice in this case. Unfortunately, when working with Amplify, it has a nice integration with DynamoDB so if you decide to use DynamoDB, Amplify will create the tables for you. But because I was not using DynamoDB and I decided to use MySQL, Aurora MySQL, I needed to set up the database first. So once I set up my database, then I needed to connect Amplify to that database so that it could generate my GraphQL APIs. And Amplify generated the mutations, the queries, and the resolvers for me based on my database schema. And I tell you, that saved me so much time. And then for the Cognito user pools, like I mentioned, Amplify integrates out of the box with Cognito user pools. It sets up the baseline user pools for you. 
and I mentioned the new user Lambda. I put a trigger on Cognito. Whenever a new user signed up, it would kick off my Lambda to then create that record in the database. Now let's talk about the React UI front end. On the front end, I used Material Table and Material UI, which are React components, and that saved me so much development time on the front end. And out of the box, Amplify does come with basic like user login, new sign up, forgotten password forms. I did have to spend some time customizing those to fit the look and feel of my application. But just having those standard components and all of the functionality tied already tied in together saved me so much time. And I also mentioned the CI CD pipeline. Once you connect your version control, and in my case, I use GitLab, but once I connect the different like development, tests, and production branches to Amplify, it automated setting up the CI CD pipeline. And there's even a cool feature called a preview where I'm able to visually see the pull requests, see it in the UI, test out the features before I actually merge. Again, that was a huge time saver. And then it integrates nicely with Pinpoint for analytics. So out of the box, it tracked the current user sessions for me, authentication events, and more. Again, saving me so much time. Now let's have a quick demo of the Salary Overflow application, and I'll also walk you through the AWS Amplify console. Here we have the starting page for the MVP for Salary Overflow. It's a very simple and straightforward screen. Here you enter your username and password, and you're able to log in. If this is your first time accessing the application, in the upper right hand corner, there is this join now button that allows you to create a new account. And then once you're able to create that account, then you can sign in. There's also an option for a forgotten password where you can send a code. And like I said, the baseline for the UI components and the integration with authentication and authorization was set up for me um, through AWS Amplify. I just needed to spend some time configuring the look and feel to match uh, that of my application. So let's go ahead and log in here. And when you first log in, it brings you to the listing of all of the salaries in the system. You can navigate to the last page, scroll through the pages. Let me go back to the very first page. And let's say you live in Atlanta, like I do and you want to filter the records based on the location of Atlanta. You do that by using this filter box at the top. And like I mentioned, I use the material table UI component. So out of the box, the filtering and the scrolling is integrated into that component, saving me a lot of time. I did not have to write code to do this myself. So here in Atlanta, you can see a developer with seven years of experience, female makes $160,000. You can see here also in Atlanta, software engineer two makes 130,000 with three years of experience. Let's navigate to the last page. Wow, we see a software engineer. This is a new record. I haven't seen this one before. <laughs> software engineer in Atlanta, oh yes, in Atlanta, that makes $300,000 with 11 years of experience. Wow, that's a good salary for Atlanta. Now let's take a look at the Amplify console. Here on the Amplify console, you're able to see the three environments. So I have a development environment, a production environment, and a test environment. And this is for the back end. Hosting environments here, talks about the front end. So there again, for the front end, I have dev, prod, and test. Now let's look at the general option here. This is where you're able to connect to version control 
for domain management. This is where you set up your custom domain name. And here, this is the preview section. Remember, I was telling you about a preview. If someone opens a pull request, I'm able to go into this screen, see the pull request, click on a URL, see it, and test it live before merging. I think that's such a super cool feature. Now, let's quickly look at AppSync. So, with AppSync, there's a schema that's based on my database schema. There's the data sources. This is where I connect the AppSync to my backend database. Now let's look at queries. This is where you run your GraphQL queries. And I do want to say that when you're setting up your GraphQL APIs, you actually have two options to secure those APIs. You can use an API key, or you can use your Cognito user pool. And in this case, because there's more maintenance with the API key, I opted for a Cognito. So here on this query screen, you have to make sure that you log in, and then you're able to call the APIs because they're secure. And on this left-hand side, you see the query window. Let's say we wanted to get a user by username. So in this case, dev test user one and we run that query and we see the resulting output and in this case i don't care about all of these fields coming back and that's the flexibility of graphql in this case let's say i just wanted the user id and the username i don't want the creation date and so now i've updated my query to include those two fields and now notice that's what comes back in the response. Now let's look at the user pools quickly. With the user pools out of the box, Amplify will set up your user pool for you. And then through the front end, whenever a new signup occurs, that user is added to this pool. You can do things like setting the minimum password length and other password policy requirements. And then you can also enable MFA. So that was a quick demo of salary overflow. Now let's talk about my lessons learned. GraphQL versus REST. I mentioned typically in the past, I developed REST APIs, and this was my first time using GraphQL. I really enjoyed using GraphQL because it gave me flexibility in my response. I remember late one night, I was troubleshooting an issue that was related to serialization, where I had an input of int and it could not be serialized to Boolean. And I spent hours troubleshooting why the resolver, the GraphQL resolver was not working correctly. And then it dawned on me, this field that you're troubleshooting, you don't even need this field to display on the user interface. So I just removed it from the query and the error went away. And yeah, I know some of you out there are thinking, well, isn't that just kicking the can down the road? And I would say, yes, that was kicking the can down the road. I needed to finish my MVP. <laughs> Second thing, it was very challenging to customize the default authentication screens. Remember, I mentioned out of the box, AWS gives you like sign up components, um, forgotten password components but the look and feel will not match your application's look and feel. And it took me a while to figure out how to customize that. So just know that going in, you'll have to spend extra time doing that customization. And then three, plan for your side projects to grow. When I first created this side project, it was mainly an opportunity for me to learn. But then I realized that I was onto something when a company reached out wanting to buy the IP for the application. And when AWS featured the application on this is my architecture. And so as the user base grew, I found it very challenging because I had placed this side project in my regular AWS account. So when you start to launch your startup, create a separate AWS account for your side project. I decided not to use API keys. So when you're securing your GraphQL API, you have two options. You could use a Cognito user pool 
or you can use an API key. The API key requires more maintenance because they expire ever so often. And so for my APIs, I decided to secure them using the user pool. And the last lesson learned, you do not need a team. So if you have this great startup idea and you're a team of one, AWS Amplify is really all you need. You'll be able to stand up your MVP in a matter of weeks. So what's next for you? Definitely, if you have this cool app idea, go for it. Use AWS Amplify, build your MVP, put it out there and start getting feedback. And if you're not aware of AWS Activate, it is a program for startup founders. I actually made use of this program when I was building Salary Overflow. As an individual founder, I received $1,000 in AWS credits and $350 to purchase the developer support plan. If you're a larger organization associated with a venture capital firm, you can get up to $100,000 in AWS credits and $10,000 in order to buy business support. They also gave me a free, well-architected review. So if you have an idea for a startup, you definitely have all the tools that you need to be successful. So I can't wait to see what you build with AWS Amplify. Thank you so much. It's been fun sharing about my journey with Amplify and Salary Overflow. Thanks, Keisha. That was a uh, really interesting. Um, one of the things that I'm, you know, we at the Q&A section now. In case you weren't aware, um, one of the, uh, the one of the really key things that I took away from this is is how do you learn technology, right? That's it's a problem that we all had at some point and still do in some cases. And you found a project that actually works really well to not only give value as like as an actual project, but it also lets you pull in a whole bunch of technologies. So is this sort of a an approach you always have when you want to learn new tech? Like, how did you come across this? Definitely. For me, I found that I learn best by doing. And so I have this phrase that I always say, I learn as I build. And so I always try to pick a fun, relevant use case that that's exciting for me, but then also adds value to people in the world. And so that's how I came up with the whole idea for salary overflow. I wanted to play around with AWS Amplify and learn more about that service. But then I also wanted to just like I said, do something that would make a difference in the world as well. Yeah, that, and I'm, I've sort of done the same thing. I built a, a Llama Cam website because I've got llamas. I wanted to learn about streaming video. So I found a way to learn about it. So it makes a lot of sense. Um, so with the salary overflow, um, like you're using a whole bunch of technologies um, in Amplify. I mean, it sort of all integrates to other AWS services. But I just, I like the fact, and I wanted to sort of touch on this, that you take things that are like a ready unit, like the authentication piece is what stood out to me. Because authentication and authorization, is really hard to build. And now you just went, it's already there, plug it in. Like, is this a good approach in general to building new, new technology? Definitely. I think when you're working on a proof of concept or an MVP for a product, the most important thing is really getting it out there as quickly as you can. And with AWS Amplify, like you mentioned, it comes out of the box with the user authentication and authorization piece using Cognito, which is sometimes challenging to set up. And so it was really cool that they had those components. I just had to really change the look and feel of the pre-built components to match the UI for my application. Now that piece was sort of challenging, but it was it turned out to be much easier than than I expected. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Yeah, and I think as, you know, any cloud platform sort of matures, it becomes more of a matter, sometimes I see software development like we do as sort of we're gluing things together yeah. a lot of the, the times. Like we find value in that service, that service, that service, and then we put them all together and we get a unique product, that, which is what right. we offer. Um, right. And it's, I don't know, are there cases where you wouldn't use a, a pre-built tool 
um, like any tool, not just, you know, um, the incognito, incognito, cognito, sorry. Cognito. Chrome, <laughs> Chrome mode here. Um, cognito. Are there, are there scenarios where you sort of go, ah, I'll probably build my own, not necessarily for identity, but, but other things? Well, it really depends. For me, as a, you know, I'm a software engineer at heart. And there are times where I like to make use of pre-existing libraries. And then there are times when I really want to get my hands dirty and build it in a specific way that's unique to my use case. So it really depends on your use case and the problem that you're, you're trying to solve. Um, like I said, with, with Amplify, I think it's great when you have a proof of concept or an MV, MVP that you're trying to build and you want to get something out there quickly um, so that you can have that feedback on how to like best iterate with your, with your solution. Yeah, and I, I think that's a really important part of it is that you got to evaluate those services that are pre-built because often they'll give you like 80%. And then is 80% enough of what you need to do? And then, as you said, if you're building an MVP, don't forget to tell your manager it's not the finished product. Right, um, <laughs> right. <laughs> then you, you can put these things together. So it, it makes sense in a lot of cases. Um, but yeah, don't forget that if you built your own, you've got maintenance and you've got updates and you've got yeah, everything. Right. And then um, I, I would also add on to that, if you are going to use a service like AWS Amplify, just really make sure you understand like what's going on behind the scenes. Because like you mentioned, at some point you will have to maintain whatever product you build. And if you rely solely on that tool without understanding what it's really doing behind the scenes, then you're, you're really setting yourself, yourself up for failure. Yeah, yeah, no, I agree. It's, um, th there's real value in having the fundamentals sort of at least conceptually understood, right? Right. There's a really important part, like in my world, so I do, just like you, we do teaching and we try and inform the community, I guess, through the things that we do. And you were touching on the whole dev, test, prod environments. And I think that's that might be one of the things that sometimes developers try and cut a corner maybe, or you're just <laughs> not aware. So do you want to explain the significance of having those separate environments? Definitely. Whenever you're working on a real application in the real world, you typically segment your environment. So you have this one environment where you do all of your development, your testing, and if things go wrong, it's okay because it's the development environment. And then you have the second environment called test, or some people call it the staging environment, which is this area that's not for development where, let's say, your business users can come in and test functionality before you release it to production. And that's what I realized with my salary overflow um, MVP. When I first created it, it was just really a side project, a way for me to learn. And then it sort of took off, but I, I only had one environment for it. And that was my my development AWS account. So if I had to do it all over again, I would have created Salary Overflow firstly in its own AWS account, so that I could really set it up to be with the, like Dev, Test, and Prod the way that it that it should be. Yeah, and and that often also integrates with your your automated integration pieces like CI/CD, right? So that right, yeah. Um, so and what's, and out of the box. Yeah, go eight, on. Amplify has that integration with the CI CD. So yeah. that piece of it was really cool. I just needed to connect my branches, my Git, I, I was using GitLab. So my GitLab branches and it, it set up that CI CD pipeline for me. So that was another time saving feature. Yeah, for sure. Cause it's, I've been through the whole setting it up manually way back yeah. when. I think I was using like Team City or something. So yeah, I'm, I'm a big fan of that being done for you. <laughs> Yeah, me too. Um, yeah, so so what's next for Salary Overflow? What what do you have plans for it? Do you want to expand it or what's what's in mind? Definitely, definitely. Right now I'm still in the data collection phase, so just collecting salary information. But then at some point once I collect enough data, I plan to incorporate machine learning, of course, you know, I love machine learning. I'm going to incorporate machine learning to predict salaries. So that's that's the next step. Once I have more data. Ooh. Yeah, right. Yeah. 
That's pretty cool. Yeah, you need a lot of data for that, I would imagine. You need yes. to build the models and everything. Yes, I uh, need yeah. more data. <laughs> <laughs> we always need more data. Um, yeah. <laughs> Thanks very much, Keita, for joining us for Tech Skills Day. Um, this is really valuable because uh, as a developer, I kind of like these sessions that give you all these different tools that we can use. So uh, anything you want to add at the end? Where can we see you next, maybe? Or uh, where can we find you online? Um, well, I would say if everyone can go in and enter their salary in Salary Overflow, that will help give me the data I need to work on phase two. But yeah, you can find me on Twitter. It's Keisha. K-E-S-H-A, Wills, W-I-L-L-Z. That's the best place to find me. Fantastic. Oh, that's awesome. Thanks so much, Keisha. My pleasure. Thanks for having me.
Welcome back. How good is Keisha? Like it's I just love the whole talk about, you know, finding a passion project. I keep saying this, but it's so important, I think, in the in when you well, it's not just tech really, but if you like anything, like just get it out and press all the buttons, right? Ticker, fiddle with all the things. It's really cool. Um, so yeah, I, well, yes, my hair did just get short again. It's amazing, isn't it? How that works on on virtual events. Mm, it's what we do. Um, so next up, we uh, we have uh, a guy who actually isn't too far from me. Like he just lives, I wouldn't say down the road, but it's Australia, so almost just down the road, a couple hours away. And um, Oren Thomas, he's a principal cloud operations advocate. It means that he talks about a lot of tech like we do here, right? He's at Microsoft. He's written a lot of books, like serious amount of books. It's like 40 or something, tech books. Complete nerd, massive brain. Um, these have topics like Windows Client, Azure, Microsoft 365, System Center, Exchange Server, all sorts of things tech related to more of the infrastructure side. And because of that, I thought, huh, we should talk about something around hybrid computing because it's a really hot topic right now. It's a lot of uh, projects are becoming hybrid. But what does it actually all mean? So I decided to ask Oren Thomas 10 questions about hybrid computing. So um, let's... Let's jump into it and ask questions in the chat, right? See you after. Welcome back to Tech Skills Day. I hope you're enjoying it. It's kind of fun, isn't it? Um, now, yes, some of these things are recorded, but uh, we're still here for you. We're in the chat. So if you've got questions, just put them in the chat on whatever platform you're watching this on. Um, but for now, I've got our next guests. I've got Oren Thomas, who is a principal cloud advocate with Microsoft, but much more importantly, is a very avid collector of anything space, Star Trek, Transformers, I don't know, everything. Am I right, Or Yeah. Yeah, look, if it's science fiction, um, basically 
right into it. So I've got a collection, as you can see behind me. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Star Destroyers through to Millennium Falcons through to yeah. Back to the Future. So, uh, yep, that's it for this time. Thank you. No. Um, <laughs> we have, I want to talk to Oren about um, hybrid computing or hybrid cloud. Um, and we sort of came up with 10 questions, which is why this is 10 questions with Oren Thomas, um, about what this all means. And, you know, in terms of your tech skills, how do we get you into hybrid? Do you want to be in hybrid? And, and what does it take, right? So we'll start with question number one. What's hybrid computing? Well, look, the easiest way to think about it is instead of it all being in someone else's data center, Microsoft, Amazon, Google, some of your workloads run where you are. Some of your workloads run in someone else's facility, one of these big cloud providers. And it might be that it's a database down here because it's just a small database. It doesn't need to be hosted in a hyperscale facility. And there might be other stuff, or it might be that you're running your management layer up in the cloud. You're managing all of your desktops and all of your servers through a tool that's running remotely rather mm -hmm. than an on-premises tool. And email exchange, email exchange, or exchange, which is an email product, is a great example of that. Used to almost always be on-prem. Yep. Microsoft came along and said, here's M365. Will let you uh, have us manage all of your Exchange servers, and all you'll need to do is interact with the admin center for managing people's mailboxes and so on. But you don't need to manage everything underneath it. That's a great hybrid cloud uh, model because mm -hmm. Outlook still runs on your PC. You're still retrieving email, but all of the yeah. mail services running in the cloud. Yeah, that's cool. And it's, I think one of the uh, common examples I've seen is that you, because of authentication and authorization that are kind of hard to manage, you tend to push that up into the cloud and go, hey, use that product, whatever that product is, you use the Azure Active Directory. And then you have on-prem stuff that just connects to that and go, hey, I'm going to use this. And that's sort of a hybrid setup, right? Is That's pretty common, I think. Well, yes and no. Um, in fact, Active Directory, traditional on-prem Active Directory, which has been around 20-something years, um, in a lot of organisations, they actually maintain the what we call the source of authority. The main user database sits on-prem in Active Directory, and then it uses a thing called Azure Active Directory Connect to actually synchronise those identities up to the cloud. Mm. So that actually what's happening is that the artefact exists down here, and then by synchronising, there's sort of like a, a degree of access that's then provided through that identity provider or that mirrored identity in the cloud. Mm. So in a way, the identity exists down here. Now, there are certainly cases where there's a cloud-first identity, but for the most part, if you're logging into existing services, you're probably using, you know, that Kerberos authentication that occurs with Active Directory or the NTLM or the older authentication protocols that are on-prem and you worry about that on-prem, and then you use all of the things like OAuth and so on and so forth to authenticate against cloud services. So it's half a dozen of one and half a dozen yeah. of the other. And um, in a good hybrid scenario, all of this is transparent to the user. But if yep. you're thinking about your skills, if you can understand how all of this works, then you've got a pretty good skill. Yeah, no kidding. It's a sort of hybrid. If I, to, if I were to summarize it, it's sort of like we have bits on premises that usually probably we've had for a while. And then we are sort of adding on cloud stuff um, on, on top or next to it, really, and trying to make it all work together in the best possible way. Yeah. You, and it's just about it making sense. It's not about going, look, I'm going to swallow. And hybrid's about working out what's right for a particular organization. And there's going to be mm. some organizations that need a lot of cloud. There's going to yep. be some organisations that need almost none. And a great, well-skilled hybrid person figures out what that balance is for the individual organisation. Yeah, that's excellent. Um, so, so we're going to move on to question two because it kind of is linked to this. It's private cloud. Like we hear about private clouds and we hear that sometimes, no, no, we've got our private cloud. What does that actually mean? So that's one of those, <laughs> there's a lot of terminology Mm. And sometimes it doesn't always make a lot of sense. It's sort of like, what's a cloud? Well, cloud's really just a really large hyperscale data, data center, right? So if you wander into an Azure facility, you go, okay, this is a really big server room. But, you know, if I go back 20 years when I was wandering into data centers, they were all smaller, but they were still pretty big. Now, 
So what's the difference between a data center and a cloud? Well, it's how you've got it set up mostly. So when we were talking a lot more about private cloud, we were usually talking about this idea of it being self-service. So as opposed to you coming to me and saying, hey, Oren, can you spin up a VM because I've got this project I want to work on and you, I'd go and put a ticket in the system and at some stage I'd go and spin up a VM and go, hey, Lars, here's your keys. Yep. In the private cloud, the idea was that you could go to a self-service portal, say Lars would like a VM and it would check whether or not Lars had permission to request the VM and if Lars had the permission, it would then basically go out and do all of the automation necessary to provision Lars with a VM. And that's mostly what the difference is, is that private cloud was sort of almost like, and there's a variety of definitions, it's all a bit of a raw shark, but it was a, it was a self-service front end to what you've got in a data center. And if you think about Azure or GCP or AWS, you've got that self-service aspect because what you're doing is you're interacting with a web portal or you're interacting with a CLI and you're saying, give me a VM. And what you're not doing is you're not going, well, what I need to do is build a virtual hard disk and do that and blah, blah, blah. It all happens in the background. So mm. probably the best explanation. Yep. Yeah. No, I think that that kind of made sense um, because private cloud and public cloud, they're both data centers, right? It's just how you access them and who can access them, I guess, is sort of the main difference. And who's got response, sort of who's got responsibility? So one of the things that... Um, the cloud does is because it does it at scale suddenly someone else is taking responsibility for all of the the, the stuff like who's making sure of the things air conditioned because data centers generally need to be kept at a certain temperature who's making sure that power is being supplied to the data center who's making sure that you know hardware failures are being dealt with because hardware failures are a commonly occurring event Right now, if it's your data center or if it's your server room, when I got started, it was only a server room and the hard disk went on the server. Well, Muggins had to go down to the server room, pull the hard disk, go and put a new one in and rebuild the server. What happens when you abstract that away and you let someone else worry about it? You never know. So, mm -hmm. and the storage is all redundant. So if something fails, someone certainly comes in and replaces that, that hard drive or that SSD or whatever, but you don't need to worry about that. No, and you never notice. So, yeah, um, now that we're talking about hybrid computing, um, it's, it's easy to kind of get to the, the mental model of, hey, we're using hybrid computing because we're moving to the cloud. But it's sort of like, like why is hybrid computing not an interim step? Like, it, this is sort of more of a permanent solution in a lot of cases, isn't it? Look, it's going to be, you, if you want to um, laugh at yourself, write down what you think the future is going to be like and then read your prediction in 20 years' time. We don't know. Um, no. so if True. we think about something like, you know, we've got a Raspberry Pi here, right? Mm. That's probably more computers uh, compute than we're sitting in someone's server room 25 years ago. This is basically almost to the point of being disposable. Yeah. So when we're looking at hybrid cloud, are we all going to move into these hyperscale data centers? Well, a lot of the thinking about this is obviously there is that level of convenience where you're sitting there going, look at how redundant it is. There's all of these bits and pieces and all of that. But then you've almost got like what we've got with power in Australia is a good example, right? You think about how the grid has changed from these massive power stations to all of these people putting these little generating units solar generating units on their roof. And then suddenly we've got this very distributed infrastructure as well. And it could be that it's cheaper for some workloads where you're not worried about the cost because you're like, well, that costs 50 bucks, right? And I can go and run a server for 50 bucks. And if it fails, I go and pay another 50 bucks and get another bit of hardware. And you might want to run that right next to where you are. Or you might go, no, I need all of that insane compute power that I can scale up to in the cloud. Uh -huh. So hybrid will be where most people end up because they need a bit of one and a bit of the other. And what they need is going to change over time. And what they commit to is going to change based on their needs. So if you can go and get a really powerful server, like and do machine learning, and you can do it in your capacity and you're only going to pay like, a couple of thousand dollars for that rig, why don't you run it yourself? Why would you go and rent one? But if you only need it for a couple of weeks, go and use the cloud. Yeah. 
Yeah, and it's and it's a lot of it is if it ain't broken, don't fix it, right? There's there's no point throwing money at something just to move it to a different data center, which is what the cloud is essentially. So we want to get the best of best best worlds as as long as we can. You really have it all all comes down to IT is about organizations solving business problems that they've got with technology. So you think about it, and most organizations have solved the critical problems that they need to solve with technology. They've either bought off the shelf software or they've had it written themselves that does something that helps their business because they're not in the business of writing software. Most organizations are in the business of selling tractors or retail or they're a medical establishment. They're not in the software business. So if they've got those problems solved, they need them, and if they, they probably don't want to solve them again, so they're not going to needlessly migrate to something, or they might come to solve it again and then try and figure out, well, what's the best way yeah. to crack that particular egg? Yeah, for sure. Um, all right, let's 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 move into something a bit more hands-on. What, what's a typical hybrid cloud computing architecture? Like, what does it look like? Okay, so my favourite one, actually comes down to what's probably the still the most common server role in the world. And that's a file server. You think about when we go right back to Xerox Park, what were we doing? We were sharing files with one another. I've got to work with a document. You've got to work with a document. A whole group of people need to work on a document or share a document or put it somewhere safe so that it can all be backed up. So it's all central, not sitting on someone's machine. So the problem with data or one of the problems with data, is a thing called data exhaust. That is, every organisation is generating new documents every day, and those documents consume disk space. Now, right from when I got started as an administrator in the 1990s, I had a problem, right? We had file servers, and people kept filling them up. So we had to do something about that. We had to figure out, I mean, we had to go and nag people to go and delete their files because we really didn't, even zip disks went around then, so we couldn't get them to back up to that. Like, it was if it's really important, back it up to a floppy, right? Yes. So there's always been this problem where organisations are constantly generating data that they need to do something with. And generally, for most organisations in the world, that's file server data. It might be Excel, might be PowerPoint, whatever. Now, the other interesting thing about data, or that type of data, is that once someone doesn't access it anymore, so you go and create a spreadsheet or you create something like that and everybody goes and looks at it when it's new. And then after a couple of months, there'll be a moment when no one's going to touch that again. And in fact, you can almost say that if something hasn't been touched for 90 days, it's probably unlikely to ever be needed again, except for for compliance purposes or occasionally you've got someone who runs screaming to you, I need that spreadsheet from six years ago. ago. Yep, yep. Right. Now, the problem that an IT pro has always had has been, well, what do I do? Do I just, how do I muck out the file server? Do I go and put it on backup tapes? And then where do I go and put the backup tapes and so on and so forth? So one of the things that hybrid cloud fixes is there's a service in Azure called Azure File Sync. And all you do is you take your existing file servers And without changing anything from the user's perspective, you hook in a service that sits there and automatically tiers all of the content on that file share up to the cloud. And then what it does is it says, right, anything that's over a certain age, I'm going to leave a placeholder file here. So it looks like the file's on the server, but in fact, it's not. It's actually sitting up on this infinite storage of the cloud. Mm. Instead of me worrying about marrying, uh, worrying about managing a two terabyte file share, that terabyte, that, that two terabyte file share in, essentially becomes infinite because every time a file sort of ages out into not being used, it tears up to the cloud. Now, if someone comes along and is browsing that file share, it looks like everything's still there. And if they go to open that file from six years ago, the first things that happens is that, that file server contacts the cloud and it pulls that file back down and presents it to them. Yep. So it's all of like uh, with something like Dropbox or OneDrive, except for with Dropbox and OneDrive, you generally have to select, oh, don't keep this locally. What's happening with that hybrid technology is that that's happening automatically. The other thing that that solves is let's say you've got a file share and you've got 10 branch offices. And you want the same files to be present in all branch offices. Well, figuring out how to replicate those files has always been a challenge. When you plug this hybrid cloud technology in, well, that becomes your your source of truth, your ultimate Mm -hmm. backend for all the files. 
And yeah. every file server just suddenly becomes a front end to that back end in the cloud. And that's a perfect example of a seamless hybrid technology because people aren't aware of it. They're getting fast access to their files because they're essentially being locally cached on the file server that they've been using for 20 years. But what you've got is you've got this incredible storage area that's almost infinite. That's really cool. What did you call again? File exhaust. Is that what you said? Data uh, data exhaust. Data and exhaust. The, the product is as your file sync. And that just yeah. plugs into any Windows server file. Sync. I haven't heard that term before. Data exhaust. That's awesome. I like that. Uh, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I was going to mention OneDrive, but you're right. OneDrive, once you've pulled it down, it's there. It's not going to go back up again. Yeah. Right? Whereas yeah, exactly. if there was a setting in OneDrive that says, if I haven't opened this file for 90 days, yeah automatically sync it. And there's another file setting where you can just say, look, always maintain 30% free space on this volume. And yep. then what it'll do is if you've got files that are younger than that, it'll just start shunting those up to the cloud. And yeah, they, the cool. moment you write it, it does shunt it up to the cloud automatically. Mm. But mm. what it does is it removes it and just leaves a placeholder locally. Yeah, that's sweet. Yeah, that's a good example. Um, all right, well, we're going to go to question number five. Um <laughs> Just so we keep track of them, which uh, which technical skills do I or you watching? What do you what do we need to work in a hybrid uh, environment? You need to be able to solve the problems that the organisation that you're going to work for has. Mm. So, in terms of what you need, now I come from a Windows Server on-prem. Uh, small to medium to enterprise size IT background, which meant that I had to learn how to manage file servers, printers, authentication. Oh, God, printers. Yeesh. Yeah, well, it turns out that people still use printers, right? Mm -hmm. And printers tend to break. There's a reason that in office space, they have that wonderful scene in the movie Office Space, which you know, 20 or something years old now, where they go out into a park and they absolutely maybe beat, uh maybe one of our moderators can find that link and put it in the chat or someone else beat can beat the stuffing out of a printer with a baseball bat. <laughs> um That's fantastic. But, and authentication because people forget their passwords or they get locked out of their accounts. It's mm -hmm. backup and recovery. So for a lot of, if you're going in on the IT pro side, what you're doing is you're solving problems that you've been solving all the time. Because I got started doing it for family and friends. I'd go and fix people's computers. And, you know, it started off that they'd go and buy me dinner or something like that. And I'd fix yep. someone's computer. And then eventually you're getting paid for it. And then you're eventually doing it for a, for a job. So in terms of those skills, some of the basic skills are just how do I actually fix something? How do I fix the internet? How do I work out why the internet can't connect to something? And then you learn what DNS is. I was about to say it's always DNS. Because <laughs> it's always DNS. But you ask most people to diagnose what the DNS problem is and they'll be lost. Yep. Or if someone can't get to a website, you know, how do you diagnose that? So a lot of, as I... I say a lot of IT is problem solving. As a developer, even, what you're doing is you're solving a problem. You're solving mm -hmm. it in a particular scale because that's what your application does. It solves a problem. But that learn how to troubleshoot. Learn how to think like a troubleshooter. And those are going to always be critical skills because stuff goes wrong mm -hmm. and you need to figure out how to fix it. Learn how to research a problem and how to find the right answer that you can trust. That's actually a really important skill. You don't want to just go and throw a search a query into Google and then use the first answer that you get. But you just add more RAM, right? Oh, if you're running Chrome, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but Yeah, and then... Oh, sorry. If we, because I'm, I'm thinking as a developer, right, and you're thinking as an infrastructure guy, um, most of the time, anyway. And I'm thinking, well, as a developer, I, am I really going to worry about hybrid? You know, maybe not, because it's sort of like abstracted from me. So I'm thinking, okay, well, what are some of the typical sort of technical roles that would work with this hybrid uh, cloud computing stuff? Well, even as a developer you might have to keep it in mind because, okay, you've got the I'm in front of an ID and I'm splashing code into it type of developer. Mm -hmm. And then when you're moving to more of your architect level, you start to run into these wonderful things around compliance and regulation about where is my data being oh, stored. Yeah. So hybrid actually solves some of those problems with certain architectures where you might have the front end 
sitting in the cloud. And in the old days, we might go and put a perimeter network or a DMZ and we'd have our web servers or whatever sitting in the DMZ and then we'd have the database server sitting somewhere safe on-prem. Mm. You can still have your database server or your data source sitting on-prem, but your web front end sitting in the cloud and then have that really highly scalable, highly scalable and all cloudy and frothy and all of that. And then you can keep your data actually fairly close to where it needs to be because there are many places where you need to be in charge of the data that's in within your wall. If you're in healthcare, for example, there's a whole ton of regulations, depending on what your jurisdiction is, about where data can travel. And any hospital administrator who's lost a USB drive with patient data on it knows that transmission or movement of patient data is actually one of those things that if you get it wrong, lawyers get involved yeah yeah that's true um yeah no yeah you might be right i still i still think that if you're in the say the admin side of things more if you're working with you know vms and infrastructure you're more prone to being you know you you'll see more of the hybrid world if you're in it whereas the developers are less but i think you're right you do need to be aware of it well um yeah. I mean, there's there's some truth in that, and maybe there's not. Developers tend to like where the new stuff is, and a lot of the new stuff is in the cloud, right? Shiny. However, there's still 8 billion lines of COBOL out there, and most yeah. of that's probably running on-prem. So there is certainly opportunities for developers who understand hybrid technologies to figure out a way to marry those legacy applications that are not going anywhere and have been around for decades and will still be around for decades with some of the newer technologies. It's not just the new frothy, what's the latest framework sort of stuff running in the yeah, cloud. Yeah, true. It's about working out where is the business. And often organisations are where they want to be, mm. not where you would like them to be as a technologist. Yeah. Um, by the way, I brought a snack. And I thought... I'll just share it. See? Oh, it came upside down. I'm sorry. Have you ever seen a meteor oh, chocolate? A it's actual chocolate as well. It's fantastic. Ah, I was going to use that as my uh, yardstick for your question quality. Anyway, uh, my answer, your answer quality. <laughs> um, okay, question seven. Seven. Uh, what, what are the biggest challenges with hybrid cloud? What are some of the things that you just go, oh, crap? Part of it's connectivity and understanding what the appropriate connectivity solution is. Part of it is actually working out where should something run. Um, there are organisations mm. that have performed every sort of migration and then suddenly realised that, oh, this doesn't do what we thought it was going to do. So... I suggest that the best way to deal with any sort of migration to a new platform is to do it as incrementally as you can, not just one of those cowabunga jump into the pool sort of things. Um, yeah, yeah. Because there are many organisations who shifted everything up to the cloud and then went, oh, no, this isn't meeting our needs at all, and then had to pull it back on prem. There's a lot of organisations that didn't do that. It was a one-way trip. But, you know, it's sort of like people migrating around the world. You know, interestingly enough, you know, the group that comes to Australia and leaves the most who come here to live is often the English who come here for the weather. And then a few years later, they actually go, oh, actually, that wasn't what we thought it was going to be like. Uh -huh. We actually preferred what we already had. Or it might be that they miss family or something like that. And that that's one of the big challenges is, you know, um, understanding where something is. And because a lot of cloud computing is so new and because a lot of the technologies that cloud in the cloud are so new, you can see the upsides, but you can't necessarily see what the compromises are that you need to make to use those technologies. So because it's in its infancy, there are, that, that's going to be one of your challenges is that you might make a bet on something and we've seen that. We've seen services like container orchestration. There's been a variety of different container orchestration solutions that have come and gone. Now, if you mm -hmm. made a big bet on one of the early ones, well, 
you might be lucky or you might have found yourself having to migrate to another container orchestration yeah. solution. Whereas if you're making a bet on something like a virtual machine, well, they've been around a while, they're probably not going to change. No, they just get bigger <laughs> all the time. Um, all right, question eight. We are almost at time, so we've got three more questions. Um, what is edge computing and does it? how does it and does it relate to hybrid? You and I are of slightly different opinions on this. Um, edge, edge computing, um, as you've sort of seen it, is very much where you're going out and putting resources like content deployment networks and so on, very yep. close to where people are consuming that content. Um, I've seen it defined as simply, some people think of it as purely on-prem, that if I'm querying a database, uh, I need to have a replica of that database near to where I am. That's kind of a bit different to a CDN. Um, so edge computing is trying to make things closer to where people are. How much that matters is probably actually much more dependent on the kind of infrastructure you've got avail available to you. If you're in Antarctica, you probably need your data with you replicated right now. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter what your content delivery network is because you probably want your application running in the same location as where your data is. So, um, yeah. yeah. It's, yeah, I think edge, edge computing to me is more of moving the bits that get consumed a lot that aren't huge, move them closer to where they consume, like where the users are and, and so on. But, yeah, it's, it's an interesting concept in terms of hybrid because... A lot of the hybrid stuff is also transactional, right? Oh, excuse me. You you get these, uh, like you said, with the file server, right? Well, if we can move those kind of things closer to the user, maybe that's a good thing. Maybe not. Um, yeah, and I'm yeah. not sure that that's officially edge computing or not. It's like one of those no. <laughs> private cloud where you've got a consultant or someone who's trying to make some money who's come up with a nice term. <laughs> it could be. And they will spend, you know, it'll cost you a lot of money for them to define it properly for you. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, if you, as, you know, dear viewer, um, have an opinion on edge computing, put it in the comments, uh, the comments and chat and uh, and see if we can, uh, maybe we can define that a bit better. Um, okay. So this relate a little bit to what we talked about at the start, but is there a time when hybrid computing is no longer re relevant? And I'm sort of asking that because obviously Tech Skills Day is, as an event, we're trying to, to you know, inform our learners on what skills are going to be relevant and what, what should they focus on. So is there a time when hybrid is not going to be relevant, do you think? There's a wonderful quote, reports of my death have been greatly exaggerated. Now, <laughs> we know that there's 8 billion lines of COBOL out there. The death of mainframes has been predicted for the last 30 or 40 years, yet there are still mainframes. Mm -hmm. So the idea that on-prem's going away is probably where I would take into account those two previous examples when answering the question, is on-premises going to go away? So, look, there's a, a lot of servers out there, even something like a Raspberry Pi, that can handle the traffic that, you know, my high-end web server was handling a few decades ago. And so there's no reason to think that, you know, compute won't get cheaper. It'll continue to get cheaper. It'll continue to get more capable. And now finally, question 10, and because this is Tech Skills Days and we are plural side, well, I'm going to ask, where can you go and learn more about hybrid cloud? Bit of a leading question there. Oh, I suppose I'm meant to answer plural site, right? <laughs> no, you don't. <laughs> Whoever um, you think is the best. So, look, it depends on where you want what you want to learn. Um, to an extent, where you start with is you start with things like, you know, at Microsoft, we've got docs.microsoft.com or we've got Microsoft Learn. We also, you can go to your local learning partners and you can, if you're an in person training person, you might go there. But it might be that you get a subscription to a technical library because ultimately what you need to do is you need to find the method of learning that suits you. And 100%. there is no one size fits all to learning. There's certain types of learning. Video-based training is absolutely great for a certain type of learner and reading is absolutely perfect for another sort. Yep. So uh, again, I'm going to lead you into this. Are there certifications for this, Oren? So... I've just been responsible for spinning up a new certification at Microsoft, which is essentially a Windows Server hybrid admin associate cert. And that takes the old, what used to be the MCSE or the MCITP, and sort of shows how that role has evolved 
to include but not be replaced by cloud technology. So it's all about those things that I was discussing, such as yep. use your file sync, how you make your file service. It's all the basics of how you manage a file server, but how you then add cloud technologies to make it better. How you do this and how you add cloud technologies to extend those capabilities. Yeah, cool. And we are um, at here at, well, Pluralsight slash Cloud Guru, we're the same company now. Uh, we are in the middle of, of producing these courses for, for those two exams. Uh, I have no idea when they're done. Don't ask me that, but we are in the middle of, of actually creating them. So, so that's kind of cool. And, you know, I'm a big fan of certification for many reasons. We can get into that another time. Um, but for now, um, thank you very much, Oren. This is, was um, quite cool. Um, and I even got to show off my one meter chocolate. So there is that. Um, <laughs> Um, the uh, Don't go away, though, because there's much more coming up on Tech Skills Day. Uh, but, yeah, thanks, Oren, for joining us, and I'll uh, see you next time. Thank you very much, Lars, and have a wonderful event.
and we're back again. I know. Thanks very much, Oren. Um, hybrid computing. It's it's like a mystery of combining old school, new school, cloud, everything. Yeah, I, I kind of like it. It's a, it's a bit of a jungle, hence we did this session, right? So now, before we get to our next speaker, let me just reiterate two things. One is, have you noticed the sunglasses flying across the screen? There's an actual game where you can win prizes. Um, we can probably get one of the moderators to, to link to the actual terms if we need to in the comments or in the chat. But um, count the sunglasses, the skull with the sunglasses. Yeah, count those and you might win something. I know. And then the other thing is that at the end, so after the next two sessions, we're going to have like a get together on Discord. And again, the link will be in the chat. So if you want to join us on Discord, we're all going to be on there live. Well, some of us are going to be. Um, and we can talk more about everything, learning, everything, ACG, Pluralsight, Cloud, whatever it is that you want to talk about. So uh, join us there as well after the next two talks. Now, next up, we have Banjo. Uh, Banjo is a senior developer advocate at AWS, and uh, he helps builders get sort of excited about AWS, which is cool. We want to be excited about technology. Uh, Banjo is also passionate about, I'm going to read this, operi, op, op, opera, 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 no, I can't tell you that. He likes data. Yeah. Um, and he started a podcast, a meetup, open source projects, everything around utilizing data, which is really cool. And after the talk, there will be a 15 minute, roughly 13 maybe, um, live Q&A session. So put all your questions in the comments or in the chat and we'll uh, we'll source them to Banjo and I'll ask him on a live session. I know, this will be exciting. Um, so I'll stop talking. I'll let Banjo take over. So enjoy and I'll see you very soon. Hey everyone, welcome to Tech Skills Day. Today I'm gonna to be talking about building data collection solutions in the cloud. So a little bit about me. My name is Banjo Biami. I'm a senior developer advocate at AWS. I'm a fan of JRPG games like Persona, Final Fantasy, and Dragon Quest, and I organize three different meetups. You can follow me on Twitter at, at Ban is the man. So what is data collection? I like to think of data collection as the process of gathering and measuring information. This could be text files, it could be images, measurements. It's really just having a process to gather this data, store it, and be able to measure what's happening. This allows us to answer questions and evaluate outcomes. So really, data collection helps decision makers. Should I buy or sell this? Should I move over here? Do I want to read more books? What's the best thing? So data collection is a process of gathering information and allows us to make decisions with that information later. When it comes to building these solutions, uh, compute is really the first building block. So how can I actually create a process to gather these raw into information? I need to make a Python file to scrape data from a website. Do I need to do some type of image processing? So really when you think of compute is actually the, the foundation of how I'm actually collecting this data and processing it. You can think of storage of actually storing that data. So how can I make that data available after I have the, the mechanism that grabs that data and I need to put it somewhere? This could be this a file system. This could be a, a bucket in the cloud. So it's really how can I just get that information, store it? It could be a database. So really access to that data. So storage is really, really key. Once you have the data, there needs to be a mechanism to just store and retrieve that data. And then I like to think of analytics. So how can I make sense of this data? I have this data in the database, but how can I see, make a query on that database? Or how can I identify what was the last inputted role in that database? So the analytic tools allow us to make sense of the data so we can answer questions, make decisions, and be empowered by the, the data we have. And when it comes to leveraging the cloud, uh, the cloud really brings on scalability. So if I have a lot of data inputs, I'm collecting a lot of data, I, I wanna be able to do this at scale, petabytes of data, uh, trying to just run a data collection script on my laptop, so not gonna cut it. So by leveling the cloud, it really, really allows us to scale out data collection, the data access, the data storage. That's one of the benefits of leveraging the cloud. Uh, automation, I guess I can't just run a script on my laptop every morning. I definitely wanna have something that allows me to run this continuously in the background, not have to worry about it. Uh, the, the cloud really allows you to build out that automation framework so I can just build my code and have the, the data collection process run. 
and then tooling. And by leveraging the cloud, there are a lot of different tools that can easily spin up. I don't have to write custom code for everything I do. The cloud has plenty of tools that can leverage and to start building a, a great developer experience. So these are the three big uh, utilizations I, I leverage from the cloud when building data collection applications. So to highlight how I leverage the cloud, I'm gonna walk through a real example that I as a developer advocate had to, to manage last year. It's like, uh, what has the activity been at, at AWS meetup groups in the past year? So um, the, the question we wanted to know is like, how can we help these user groups? But in order to do that, I need the data understanding what user groups are meeting, uh, what, what are they doing? What are they missing? How many people are showing up? But without any data, I really can't take any action. So I built a data collection process to, to collect this data and understand how to best help uh, the user groups. So I'm gonna walk through here. Uh, so this is kind of the end state of some of the data I collected. Uh, a big takeaway here is about a year ago, 60% of the, the meetup groups were active. And then uh, past three months, only 37% of the groups were active. So there's a big decline, uh, it could be Zoom fatigue, whatever, but the meetup groups have not been actively meeting. So having this data allowed us to act on like, what are the meetup groups that aren't meeting? What are they using? What help did they need when the last meetup, et cetera. So I'm gonna walk through the process of how I collected this data and highlight the, the data collection process of, of my mindset and how it can build these solutions. So first, uh, collecting that user group. Uh, this is kind of the end state of collecting all the meetup data. Uh, from the meetup data, I leverage uh, AWS uh, a Lambda, which is, is a compute infrastructure that allows you to just run code. I leverage Amazon Location Service to see where the, the meetups were. I use EventBridge and CloudWatch for automating the solution. I uploaded the data to S3 and then had Amazon QuickSight for the analytics portion. So now I'm gonna walk through exactly step-by-step how each of these components work. <clears throat> so the first is the compute. So leveraging the, the meetup has a GraphQL endpoint. So GraphQL allows you to make very structured queries to get the exact data you want. It's different than uh, other APIs, which are REST-based, which just give you a bunch of data, but, but might, might, you might not necessarily need all that data. And the benefits of GraphQL is it allows you to make more granular requests, which allows you to make many more requests. So you're not as rate limited compared to other traditional APIs. So this allowed me to scale up very easily and get lots of data I needed for my data collection solution. And here's an example of a GraphQL query. Uh, basically, you, you set all the parameters you want. So URL, name, city, link, uh, zip, description, et cetera, past events. And then you get a nice JSON formatted uh, response back of all the data you need. So by doing this on all the hundreds of user groups, I'm able to get all the information I, I need, when, how many people in the meetup group, how many past events they've had, uh, when was their first event, et cetera, and wh wh where it's located. And then based on getting where it's located, I, I used uh, Amazon Location Service, which allows you to use a request from Esri, which is a, a mapping geolocation service. So basically once I have the, the name of the city, I can actually send a request to the service and get the latitude and longitude. So this is where tooling comes in handy. I didn't have to build my own geolocation service. I was able to leverage another service and then get the data I needed. So that's a real big benefit there. There's tooling available for you to easily plug and play and help you on your data collection journey. Uh, so storage, once I had all the, the, the data I needed, I needed to store that data so I can be accessed in other locations. So for this, I used, uh, created a Python script to make a, a CSV file. I uploaded that to S3 bucket, which makes the data highly available in a nice CSV form. Once in a, it's in a nice CSV form, it can be accessed from many different endpoints and it can build a lot of different analytic solutions on top of that. So storage is, is key and that's making the data available so it can be used in many other formats and consumed by other uh, users or applications. Uh, so automating, so like I said, I, I first ran this on my laptop, but that's not gonna be scalable. I want this to run every day without my input. So 
by leveraging the serverless application model, I was able to build a continuous function that will run my meetup data collection script and then upload it to S3 bucket every 24 hours. Uh, I leveraged the uh, AWS SAM service application model to this. You make a nice YAML file, which tells you I want to run this, this script and I want to run it every 24 hours. And then that's it's really simple. Once the, you get the syntax and you set up your script and it just runs continuously uploading, uploading the data. So I'm running compute automatically and storing that data automatically. So real big benefit of the cloud, very easy to, to set up the, set up this type of framework. And it was very powerful for me to just not have to think about is my data running? Is it gonna, is it gonna update it? It just runs it in the background, it's automated. A very powerful uh, advantage of using the cloud. And then the next the analytics portion, uh, I leveraged a tool called Amazon QuickSight, which allows you to build dashboards and uh, it's able to just this point and click, you can draw maps, you can draw big metrics, you can draw pie charts. So this is very helpful for me and my team to understand what meetups are active, what meetups were not active, uh, how many times people are meeting, how much how are meetup groups growing uh, month to month, day over day. So really under helping us make decisions. We focus on the meetup meetup group over here or down south or wherever. So this this solution is really able to build and other people can also build dashboards on top of this, not just me, because the data is, is just in a raw format and allows people to access that and build solutions on top of that. So there's a very powerful solution that I'm able to collect the data and then build an analytics to help us and our team answer that the questions from how do we best engage with data groups. So to recap kind of this data collection story that I, that I built, uh, I built a pipeline to ingest raw data. We saw that compute is very powerful, uh, allows you to, I ran a Python, a, a script on an AWS Lambda, and then I up, and then I was able to upload that data. So schedule, uh, schedule that uh, pipeline to periodically gather and store that data. Is it, it was uh, used to the Amazon SAM to easily just build that, that YAML file, build the Python script, and then upload the data to S3 and then develop the analytic solutions to help answer questions. So using that QuickSight dashboard, I was either able to create uh, metrics, maps, pie charts, all those analytics solutions to help us understand the data and then make decisions on that. And you can extend that solution to many other type of problem domains. I just kind of laid down a very simple process of how I leverage tools, like how I leverage the location service to easily get that the geolocation data. But this could be used for if I need to collect text files, PDFs, whatever. But you saw how simple the solution is, but it's very powerful and allows us to, to build nice scalable solutions and leverage the tooling that cloud provides. Uh, so I like to write about uh, managing, creating workflows in the cloud. Uh, I talked about structured locking in one post, uh, migrating workloads to the cloud, and then this, this talk of how to track and analyze and visualize user group data. You can find it at the acloudguru.com uh, blog author, Banjo Biami. And you can also follow me on Twitter as well. I like to post about cloud and building and lots of fun stuff. I'll be in the chat afterwards to answer any questions and talk through anything you might be interested in. Thank you for listening. And here we are. Now we're live. So if you've got questions for Banjo's talk, oh, hi, Banjo, you're here. <laughs> hey, how are you? <laughs> <laughs> I'm good. So everybody, we got Banjo live and uh, I've got a few questions I've written down. There's a, at least one question in the chat as well that we're going to get to. So when we talk throughout this section, please just feel free to put your, um, your questions in the chat, right? And uh, But I'm going to start. And thank you, Banjo, for being here. This is very cool. We can do this live. Um, <sighs> How could, you were talking about cloud you know, leverage, but how do we do that effectively? Like, how do we make sure we don't just use cloud because it's cloud? Um, like, where do we, what are the triggers? What are some of maybe the red flags we look out for? How do we do that effectively? Yeah, so like you said, when I build applications, I always like to just build from my laptop. And if it worked on my laptop, 
we think, why do I need to use the cloud? So that really kind of dictates by thinking like, when should I leverage the cloud? How should I use the cloud? And I like to think of it, if I need to automate something, I don't want to be using my laptop and going there and typing in commands. I want this to run without my input. So the cloud helps enable that automation piece. And then I think about how scalable is the solution? I go back to my laptop, I'm running it. Can I handle lots of data? Can I do the ingest? Is my battery going to die because there's too much processing going on? So the cloud helps alleviate those fears of like how big can the data, the ingest, the compute, storage, all these things that I don't want to worry about and managing on my own. So that's how I leverage the cloud is when I automate solutions and scale solutions out. Yeah, the automation part of it, I find, is one of those things that, you know, as developers, right, we sort of, hey, we're lazy. That's why we're developers, right? So we want to automate things. We don't want to do things again that have already been done. And automating things that can be automated is a really cool way of doing it. Now, having said that, sometimes that's also where you get in trouble, right? Because you go, oh, it works, and you leave it, and you come back a week later, you go, oh, dear, what have I done? Right. So can you can you sort of make sure that doesn't happen? Are there, can we, are there tools that we can use to sort of prevent that? Yeah, when it comes to the cloud and things are just running automatically, you want to have visibility, observability of what is going on. So that's very important. As developers, we, we're looking for a type of certainty that we know our code ran and did the things we did. But the only way that we can get that level of certainty is we know what is going on. We have observability. We have tools that can inspect what is going on. We can debug if something's broken. So building in mechanisms allow that observability so I can be certain yeah. the code is running how I know it should be running. Yeah. Use alerts, people. Use alerts. <laughs> yes, um, alerts. Nah, exactly. <laughs> now, you're talking about data collection, and that made me wonder, like, what's the strangest, weirdest, most interesting, whatever, data set that you've come across? Like, what, what are the kind of data that people collect that you go, huh, never thought of that? Yeah, data could be really anything that helps enable some type of purpose. I've seen uh, images of this, a field. We're trying to detect uh, different uh, places in a particular field. Like it could be uh, like farm fields. Like if I want to see where the best to grow grow uh, certain crops. I've seen data, uh, traffic safety data, like how many uh, cars had accidents at this road. How can we make it more safer? What are the type of tools we can utilize for that to help make that road more safer based on the, the traffic incidents. So all sorts of data sets that allow uh, people and government and commercial, all types of things that people are collecting data to help optimize their processes. Yeah, that's, you mentioned like agriculture and farming and stuff. And this, I saw an example here in Australia where there were some of these farmers that are like really cutting, cutting edge and they had soil sensors in like, so they had a, a field that was, let's say, 10 acres. And this, they would have data for each individual, like, I don't know, square meter almost, not quite, but really, really tiny, like, sizes, and know exactly what this moisture level and you know, all the nutrition and everything. And then their, their sprayers would communicate with that or their, you know, fertilizer machines, whatever. I'm not a farmer. I don't know the right terms. but And then they would actually use that data, this huge amount of data, to make sure that they're only fertilized where they needed to and the machine knew where they were with GPS coordinates and all this sort of stuff. Like it's just, it's mind boggling what you can do with these data collection of these data sets when you collect it, right? So yeah, yeah some amazing. of this is really cool. <laughs> mm. And I, I don't know how well it worked, but I'll just like the fact that they tried, right? <laughs> so yeah, we can absolutely be more efficient with how we use data. That's, that's very cool. Um, now we had a question from the chat and oh yeah, Matthias has just mentioned saying, it's got to be actionable alerting that we're using, not just alerts. And that's a good point. Yeah, good point. Thanks, Matthias. Um, now, uh, Hamad asked it in the chat, what are the best free resources to learn AWS for DevOps? Um, and he's particularly after project-based learning, which I agree with. Like, I like project-based learning. Yeah, learning DevOps is a definitely <laughs> one of those things that there's no, I guess, golden path per se. Uh, I've seen a lot of solutions. Uh, I've looked at the Cloud Resume Challenge as a great way to kind of learn how to piece things together. Uh, there are courses on ACloud Guru that I probably recommend or I've, I've used in the past. So it, there's no, I guess, like one way to, to just start build, going ahead, but it's kind of a collection of different things. Like how would I build a CI CD pipeline? How would I containerize something? How would I push it up? How would I do observability? Because DevOps is quite a, quite a loaded term. A lot of things can go into that. Definitely. Uh, so yeah. it's, 
it's hard to say you must do X, Y, Z, and then you'll be a DevOps professional. And I, I don't know if that's a, an accurate thing to say right away. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I, I agree with you. It just the, that term DevOps, um, I was doing, I can't remember what I was doing, a talk or something on it once. And I looked up the definition for DevOps and there isn't one. Right, there's not a single definition for DevOps. So it's sort of like, hey, what do you want DevOps to be? Like, are you into making, you know, the CI/CD pipeline? Are you talking about testing? Like, what is it that you want out of the DevOps? So, yeah, it is a bit of a loaded question. You're absolutely right. Um, but I hope that helps. Matt. otherwise, put in the chat, um, and we'll, we'll we still got time. I'll just check check my clock here. I'm going to make sure I don't go over time. Hey, um, now Matthias also said hi, and uh, asked me to ask you. How do you manage to do such a great talk without your regular hair guy? <laughs> oh, <laughs> it's yeah, a bit it's of an great. inside joke there, I think. <laughs> interesting, interesting. Yes, I said I wore a hoodie, so you wouldn't be able to tell. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, Ben just been at a lot of AWS events. Um, reinvent, I'm guessing you were at prolifically. Uh, yeah, uh, yes. kind of <laughs> yeah. So, so if you want more more banjo, you can go there as well. Now, you mentioned uh, GraphQL. And Keisha also mentioned that in her talk, that that was one of the, the tools that she started using for her data project, you know, the, the salary overflow. Um, so is that one of the better tools? Like, would you say GraphQL is better suited when you start using like data-driven kind of development rather than say a REST API or a SQL database or something like what? Why did you choose GraphQL? Yeah, so the, the trade-off on considering GraphQL, I wouldn't say quote unquote better, uh, with GraphQL, you could be more granular with the data you want. So when it comes to requesting data from an external API, they normally have rate limits. Uh, if you use traditional REST-based API, you get rate limited pretty quickly when you try to get a lot of data because there's no really way to, to filter a REST-based API. With GraphQL, you can be very granular. I like only want these fields and I want it this amount. And they give you much more uh, resources to pull that data because it's such a granular scope. So for me, for when I'm trying to collect a massive amount of data, but I don't need everything, GraphQL allows me to be more precise and I'm able to collect more data if it has some type of rate limit option on it. Yeah, that makes sense. So it's much more customizable than, because often when I've used the REST API, it's like you call the REST API and you get back what you get, right? And then you could deal with it. Whereas I guess GraphQL, you can request data more accurately, more, more finely grained. Yeah. Um, oh, Matthias is that again. He's got another question in the chat. Um, <laughs> do you find that people systems can outgrow SAM or, or if so, what's the next usual step? Like how do you, if that does happen? If people outgrow, sorry. Well, he, he's written SAM, Sam, which um, uh, I'm not, this is my AWS ignorance because <laughs> I live in the Azure world. <laughs> yeah, so, so Sam is uh, stands for the, the uh basically a way to have a serverless application. So serverless application model allows you to write YAML, YAML and it allows you to deploy your serverless application. So oh, right. me, it, it gives you a nice uh, a golden path per se, if I want to deploy a serverless application and I don't want to worry about all these underlying infrastructure that's when I have a Lambda function do this and have it get scheduled. It gives you a very nice way to build that uh, application and then launch it. There are other uh, things that allows you to do similar, uh, I guess, deploying a Lambda function, but it might be more nuanced and harder to do, while Sam kind of gives you the, a nice environment to work with or a well-defined path. Yeah, right. Cool. Yeah, that, okay. Yeah, that, I hope that help, answers your question, Matthias. Um, now we've got four minutes left, and now the questions are coming. So <laughs> Bali asks, uh, where where's the data source that you're collecting? Like, are there multiple places that you need to connect to grab the data? Yeah, for, for the project I demoed, it was I was mainly dealing with Meetup uh, data, and for that I was able to just leverage the GraphQL API. But in other in other projects, you might have different sources of data, and you need to collect that. And you have a kind of a collection set where you're collecting all this data, and then you transform mm -hmm. it to a single uh, view so you can access that. So you have different collectors that are doing this, I guess, extract flame, and then you have a transformation uh, where you transform into a single five view, and then you load that into a type of data, you could be a backend database, RDS, something. But mm -hmm. you really want to have different collectors and you want to have a unified view so you can act on that data about having the right custom query for each each data source you have. Yeah, yeah. Well, I hope that asks you a question, Bill. Um, and then Leslie's asking, how would you go about the uh, you know, learning data conversion? Like, How do you use it and make it so that you can actually analyze the data? 
Yeah. So data, uh, well, my, my experience is that I leverage Python. Python has a lot of data uh, collection ability, data processing, machine learning, AI, and that's really the heart of data. Uh, there are mm. many resources on like, how would I get there? But I uh, leverage this tool called Pandas, which is an open source library in Python that allows you to do a lot of data manipulation tasks. So uh, for me, learning that ecosystem and how to, to get data and how to play with that and how I can use it, that's been a, a very foundational for me to understand on creating a framework and system that allows me to manage and play with data, that's learning that, that Pandas library. Yeah, yeah. Oh, well, maybe I can throw a challenge out to our mods here in the chat. Maybe you uh, want to find one of the courses that were either on ACG or Plus, like that will actually help you this Python and data. It's bound to be something. We got everything. <laughs> so, <laughs> I hope. <laughs> yeah, well, exactly. Um, and we got another couple of minutes. So I just want to touch on this automation stuff again, because we hear about this a lot, right? We hear it all about, you know, automate what you can. What are some of the scenarios, maybe, if, if you can answer this, that where you come across, you go, that well, automation just doesn't make sense? Because I don't think automate is always the answer to everything. Yeah, definitely. When having a human in a loop is going to be vital, especially when you're making uh, systems that are affecting actual customers that can actually cause harm to them if there's no kind of adjudication process or auditing. So having a human in a loop to say, should I let this action go forward and make sure a human looks at it and make sense. And so not everything should be automated. So when there's potential for harm to the customer or who you're serving, having a human look to verify that that system is acting in the parameters you think it's one of the ways I say humans should be in the loop and those don't just have a computer or code do everything. Having a human in the loop is vital to ensure that the process is fair and there's visibility into what's going on. Yeah, as tempting as it may be. <laughs> We uh, we do, yeah we don't want to always just automate everything. Um, having said that, I do like the the keys the the clues in the word. I do home automation a lot, all right, and I try and automate everything. So I'm I'm with you. I know I, I love automation as well. I just there's sometimes it doesn't quite make sense. So um, yeah, that makes sense. So have a gate a, a gated automation and things, exactly you know, automate to the point where you need a human to go. Yeah, nah, yeah, nah. You know, where it's those sort of harder decisions. That makes sense. Now, is there anything else you want to um, end up with here before we uh, we end up, uh, before we end? Uh, Banjo, where can we see you next? Where can we find you? Uh, there are a bunch of AWS summits going on, so I'm going to be going to as many as I can. I think there's one in Washington, D.C., Atlanta, uh, Chicago, in the U.S., and there's some uh, international ones as well. So if you go to an AWS summit, uh, come to a developer lounge and say hi to me. Otherwise, you can find me on Twitter and yeah, I'm just happy to talk with the community. Fantastic. Thank you so much for joining us live, Benja. Really appreciate it. And uh, now, everybody, we're going to have a 10-minute break, and I'll be right back after that with Gita. So don't go away. There's much more to come.
right, you ready for the last session? At least before we go and do the networking thing on Discord, right? So yeah, if you if you want to join us all afterwards, head on over to Discord. The link will be in the chat as well. Um, now, next up, we have a pretty cool conversation I had with uh, with Gita. Gita Sherma, she's from Microsoft Worldwide Learning. Um, and we're going to talk about cybersecurity in particular and what roles you need and what it actually means. Like, why do we need to worry about security? It may be obvious, it may be not, um, but this is, yeah, I enjoy this conversation. Now it is recorded, but please do ask questions still in the chat. Uh, I will be on there. more than happy to clarify anything that we're talking about. So, um, yeah, let's let's just get into it, shall we? Here's Gita and myself talking about cybersecurity. Welcome back to Tech Skills Day. Um, hope you're having a great day so far. I, um, I have a question for you. And if you want to put it in the chat, wherever the chat is, up there, down there, somewhere, um, how many DDoS attacks or deni distributed denial of service attacks do you think there were on Azure, Microsoft Azure, in the second half of last year of 2021? So put it in the chat and um, we'll see. Now you're way off. Nope. Try again. Nope. Still not right. Nope. That's a lot. In fact, there were 350,000 DDoS attacks, which is an immense amount of uh, attacks. And chances are you probably didn't even know about it, nor that you were affected by it, which is good. But there are a lot of things that you do get affected by. And for that reason, I am here with Gita, Gita Shaman. Welcome, Gita. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, and Gita works for Microsoft in the security space. It's sort of, you know, Gita's going to clarify for us. Um, but I'm going to just jump into it. And so, so we know it's important. There's a lot of attacks, but not everything is done by, by Azure, by Microsoft. Not everything is prevented, right? So, so why do we need to know about security, I guess? <laughs> Simply put, cybersecurity is just not optional. It's not a nice to have. It's a must have. Uh, the, the security itself, but also the skills to know how to discern what's an issue, what's not, and then how to remediate. So at Microsoft, I lead the go-to-market initiatives for our training and certifications. Microsoft certifications validate depth technical skills in particular solution areas, and I lead efforts for security, compliance, and identity. Um, and in the security space, we have certifications that are role-based, which means people who are working in those roles today uh, give us an idea of what types of activities they typically uh, encounter, issues they encounter, activities they typically do, what their job entails, and what the technical skills are associated with that. And based on that, we develop a curriculum content uh, and a certification exam, finally with the goal of giving you that certification, that credential that says you are validated, your skills are validated in this particular area. And they're role-based because the people who are working in those security areas right now know best exactly what their job covers and what the particular skills are. Um, so that is uh, that that that's sort of our starting point. Yeah, right. So you you mentioning roles. Um, what is there a specific tech tech roles that need security? Um, you know, either skills or certification, or where where does this fall? Yeah, I, I again, I mean, I, I think everyone needs to know about security. I say this to my family quite often, but in terms of actual roles within an organization, a lot of them are administrator or engineering roles. And the roles that we have certifications for are for security operations analysts or SecOps, mm -hmm. um, the identity and access administrator, the person who is sort of that front door validating identities, making sure the right people have access to organizational resources. Um, the, inf the information protection administrator, so they are handling uh, data protection, governance and compliance. And then we just launched actually earlier this week, a cybersecurity architect expert certification, which is oh. a much higher level. Uh, it's a bit more advanced in terms of looking at, it's a role for somebody who looks at an, an organization's entire infrastructure and helps determine the best cybersecurity approach to take based on business goals. We well, also have a fundamental certification, which is general. It's for, for, for anyone who just wants to get the basics. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the person who works on that often says it's uh, 
uh, the exam is a mile wide, but an inch deep, but it is a mile wide, you know, and there's a lot, there's a lot to cover in security yeah. there. Yeah. Oh, I've, absolutely. I've, um, I've done, um, I, I created a, a certification course for AZ900 is the Azure fundamentals. And you're exactly right. It's a huge breadth. Like you need to know about all of these different services, but you don't need to know them that deeply where I'm guessing the architecture one you do. All right, that's, um, but we can, we can get to that in just a minute. I just want to touch on, so I'm guessing some of our audience or most of our audience are maybe tech people, developers, IT ops, um, those sort of, where does security fall within, you know, and your everyday role, if you're a, say you, you're your junior dev, uh, you might be an IT ops, uh, you know, assistant, those sort of, you know, configuring uh, infrastructure, those sort of roles, where does security fall within that? Is that something that you have to do separately or is, how does that work? You know, I, I don't think it's something you have to do separately. I think, again, it's something that uh, every role should have awareness of. And then for depth, you go to the specific role. But we we have a, um, a new sort of pre-fundamentals learning path that we released last year that covers basics of cybersecurity. And those are the basics that I think everyone should have. And those would be things like, how do you identify an attack? How do you know when an attack is happening? How do you quickly mitigate? How do you understand, can you encrypt things? How do you do that? What does data protection actually mean? What do you have to protect? What does governance look like? Mm. Um, what does compliance look like? All, all of those basics, I think at a high level is something that everyone in every role should at least have that familiarity with so that if there are issues that maybe get missed, they can identify them. You know, there are people in these roles, these cybersecurity experts doing that work, but it really is down to everyone in, or, in an organization to be aware of what's happening and have at least enough knowledge to be able to know when something's amiss. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, no, I agree with that because it's, you know, any kind of modern software development, which, so I'm a developer, right? That's kind of gives away, but you know, if you're talking about development, you have to know about these things. So even if you don't have to worry specifically about, let's say, a governance or you know a, a compliance policy that that needs to be met, you do need to know you do need to know what they are or how they work, so that you know how that affects your everyday work, right? Um, and so it doesn't mean that you necessarily sit there and you write the policies and you and you know what the governance legislation might be, but you do need to know how it affects what you do, right? Is that is that kind of where you're getting at? Absolutely. With GDPR, you know, a few years ago, maybe maybe longer. I mean, everyone had to quickly become a security expert. <laughs> That's right. Really, yep. you know. And and so for developers, if you're um, working on a new app, you, you have to at least have the awareness that these things exist and that they will at some point affect the work that you're doing. Um, you have to have space for the governance principles to be in place. That my favorite GDPR principle is the right to be forgotten. Um, you know, <laughs> yes. that when that came up, um, the, this data discovery was such a big thing because people had to figure out, well, where where do we even have all this customer data if they if they decide to be forgotten? How do totally. we find it? Yep, that's a really good example, actually, how um, your architecture choices can actually be you know, have a real impact on, well, maintenance in this case or, or future products, right? Um, so if I'm, um, say I've got three years worth of experience, I'm a developer and I am building my app. It's a SaaS application. I'm using Azure as a cloud base and I'm working with the products that, that Azure gives me so that, you know, your, um, your Cosmos DB or your, um, your app services, whatever it might be, your API management, do I need to then also do this certification or, or the learning path for security on top of that? Or is there enough in those um, products enough? I mean, is there enough security from Microsoft side that I can sort of feel secure or how, how should my mental sort of um, approach be to this? Right. That's a great question. Um, yes, there is enough security that you can feel secure, but uh, there's always that, you know, yes. And, you should still be aware of what the what what essentially cloud security means. What are uh, what are all the, the the ins and outs? What do you need to think about? Hmm. Uh, and the security uh, compliance and identity funda fundamental certification we offer um, is is a certification. It's you know one of those fundamentals, but covers all of those basics of cloud security because yep. essentially Microsoft Microsoft security 
as a solution is sort of the underpinning for all of the cloud offerings we have. And knowing how those things work just gives you a deeper understanding of the products you're already using. Um, if a certification is just a bit too much of a commitment, which, you know, obviously it could be um, to sit for the exam and do all of that. We also have, as I mentioned, that pre-fundamentals learning path, which is just two hours, really the basics. But and and you can you can be in any industry, you could be at any level, and you could take it, and it would make sense and help you. Um, and from there, you can determine: is there an area that you're more interested in? Is are you thinking about maybe looking at something in cybersecurity um, as a career choice down the road? Mm -hmm. um, and then we have offerings for that as well. But um, yeah, I think I think what we what we have available today can get you started no matter what. But really, it's critical to have that deeper understanding of what cloud security is. Yep. No, that makes sense. And, and you're making me all guilty because I should probably do that certification now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, the, okay. So um, now, by the way, dear audience, uh, if we haven't already, there'll be a bunch of links in the chat for more information about on both the certifications and the learning paths as well. Um, yes, this is a recorded interview because Gita is very busy, um, but we're very lucky to have her today. So yes, we will be answering questions in the chat. It just won't be from Gita directly, but please do answer, ask questions as well. Um, so, okay, so I've got the certification now and I'm sort of, um, I'm going down the, the path of, hey, you know, I think I'm, I'm on this. I, I think I have an idea of what security means. Now, this is an ever evolving kind of um, area, I think, because as I said at the very big top of the of the, the of this session, we had a three hundred and fifty thousand DDoS attacks just on Azure last half of last year, and obviously, people are getting more and more sophisticated. DDoS in itself is not a particularly sophisticated attack; it's just basically brute force. But there are other types of you know vulnerabilities and attacks and stuff, and how do we how do we keep learning? Do we have to recertify every year? Do how do I keep on top of these the, the differences in in how my infrastructure might be vulnerable? Yeah, a great great question. Microsoft certifications do expire; they do need to be renewed every year. And the the really basic reason is our exams and all of our learn content is refreshed on a regular cadence. Roughly every sixty days, we're pushing out. Oh wow! <laughs> Right? Yeah, uh, and right. then really the exam itself is, is, is reworked based on going back to those experts in role today, the people who hold those roles, we do a job task analysis refresh. We go back to those folks and say, what are you working on now? How has the technology changed? How have the tactics changed? What are the new things we need to think about? And then we pull those into our exam and learning path content. And for that reason, you, you need to stay current because the content is current. Uh, to renew, however, it's a really simple, straightforward process. It's online, self-paced renewal. You can renew any time within the six months prior to your certification expiring. Um, it's free of charge. There's no cost. You don't need to retake the exam. You simply take an online assessment, which is shorter and quicker because it only covers the technology changes from the last time you certified. So, yeah. uh, you know, and there's prep content that you can use to to get ready for that. Um, but it's quite straightforward. And it just means that you have showed that you're up to date in all the latest changes in the exam. Our exam is up to date with everything that's happening in the industry, in the world, and you're really staying current. So that certification, once you have it, keeping it current means you're really, you know, completely skilled up, ready to go. Um, and validated uh, as yeah. an expert in that area. Yeah, I did. Uh, I had to do that new new way of recertifying for my Azure developer, AZ204. Um, and it is, it's kind of a lot less stressful because it's not a full like two and a half hour exam or whatever. That's time. Then you have to remove everything from your office if you do it at home, et cetera. It's, it's just Mars of Learn and you you just, you can basically Google things while you're doing it. Like there's no one watching and you can have all your notes and it's it's just really confirming that you still are up to date in whatever way that you see fit. So, you know, that's a bit of an advertisement for Microsoft certification, but I think that's all right because it's such a useful tool to, to kind of stay on top of things. Um, 
So if you don't mind, because we've still got a bit of time, can we go back to some of the roles that you said are working with in security? So if, if I really want to dive deep into security uh, in, say, the cloud, because this is the cloud track, um, what are the roles that, sort of, that I need to look out for? Because you had, I can't remember, I just remember architecture because everybody loves architecture, but what were the roles that you mentioned? Yeah, yeah. So we have those four, well, fundamentals is, you know, agnostic. It's any role. Sure. So there's that. But we have a security operations analyst certification. Yep. So what do they um, do in a in a like if, if you had that as a job title, what would that mean? How about you ask me what an identity and access administrator does? Because... Sure. Let's go with that one. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> SecOps, I should know what it is, and I don't. And I only okay. know about identity and access because we we actually just hired someone and I was trying to get her credentials authenticated. Ah, right. And I thought. Aha, uh -huh, this is a perfect example of, so So we have the SecOps analyst, we have identity and access administrator, and we have information protection administrator. Those are all at the associate level, which means yep. there's sort of, uh, no prerequisites. Yep. So uh, identity and access, of, of course, is the person who authenticates that you are who you say you are, and then grants access to the resources that you're meant to be able to. So that uh, includes all of like multi-factor authentication, um, exactly. physical tokens, like your, your UB keys, for example. Um, setting all those things up. And, and that can be quite involved. I did have to do that because I was recording a YouTube video for the YubiKey and I was looking into how that works because Azure has a, a built-in multi-factor sort of service in Azure Active Directory and yeah. trying to get the, the FOB key or the, no, it's not a FOB, it's a, a hardware security key in there was an interesting way of having to massage things together. So yeah, I, I, I can see that we need some sort of training for that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then uh, the newest certification that we launched earlier this week is uh, an expert level, which means there are prerequisites, uh, and that's the cybersecurity architect expert. And that's just somebody who is able to look end to end and determine what an organization's cybersecurity infrastructure should look like. The prerequisites for that, obviously, this is for someone who's further on in career mm -hmm. and already, you know, looking at things end to end. But um, either the uh, SC 300 or 400, the identity access or um, information protection will get you in, or AZ 500 or MS 500, the, oh, both either the Azure or the Microsoft 365 security admin, because uh, a lot of that is, um, so there's an exam for the architect SC 100, and then the prerequisites are one of those four uh, gotcha. exams, because those uh, areas cover a lot of the same same types of things. Obviously, again, you would already have depth knowledge going into it, but um, it's what's kind of nice, what I like about the security offerings at Microsoft is that there are many paths. You know, you can get, you can start with pre-fundamentals. You can start with fundamentals. You can be over here in Azure. You're already on the security journey. You could be working in Microsoft 365, same thing. You're already on the security journey, whether you know it or not, just because there's so much overlap um between the solution areas yep yeah oh that's i didn't know that az500 was a could be a, a valid prerequisite that's awesome um mm -hmm. because it, it means you can mix and match a little bit right um yeah which is useful and it's uh yeah so so and i know some of our audience just based on our youtube numbers we know you love arch architecture anything that says architecture but do you know this is an expert level kind of you know journey so make sure you do all the the, the fill your toolbox first before you go and do the architecture stuff i think it's, <laughs> it's definitely worth knowing and again if you do have any questions please put them in the chat we will monitor it. even though this is recorded there are people live that will answer your questions um and all the links of course to to what gita is talking about will be there too so now you did mention, Gita, that this is, you know, there's certain roles and whatever um, that this will lead into or could lead into, but it also, you know, means that all other roles really should know about security, to be honest. Now, I want to talk about this, the, the actual roles uh, in the real world. Is it, is it difficult to, to get a job with these, you know, if you had the certification, you had some experience, what are the demand like for these security positions? The demand is incredible the the growth has been exponential in the past year um i i you know digital job growth is on the rise anyway between uh last year and 2025 it's expected to increase by 149 million net new jobs right what say that again 149 million jobs 149 million 
Yeah, right. hundred so percent new jobs. All you watching this can get a job now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. A six million of those jobs will be in cybersecurity. Um, the growth forecast for the cybersecurity specialty is four hundred and five percent just in this year alone. But you know, to put it in in numbers that feel relatable, this statistic really kind of um, made me think. Wow, the gap is is such uh, an acute gap at the moment. For every two cybersecurity jobs that are filled currently, one sits empty. So, you know, that in the United States. So yeah, for yeah. every two people who, who join in a cybersecurity role, a third job is just sitting empty because people aren't skilled. It's a shortage of skills to fill those roles. So what you're sort of getting at is that if I was in a, a reasonable sized company, um, you know, say more than maybe a thousand people. I'm not sure, but there's a lot of companies in that size. If I upskill, it's very, very likely that I could move into a different role that might have some of these elements. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, it, because again, the demand—it's not the demand is not going to abate anytime soon. Um, but the skills, the gap is simply widening hmm. with people. You know, uh, it, people moving around, changing careers, looking at new things. But I think. I think with cybersecurity, and this is feedback I've gotten from people, people just think, well, it's not for me. Well, it's too, it's beyond my my scope. It's too technical. It's too complicated. Yep. It's, you know, all of that. It's not. This is why we have that pre-fundamentals learning path. You, you really can start to dive into it wherever you are. You could be uh, in university. You could be ready to go into university. You can still look at this and start to pick up some of these concepts and then determine what depth you would want to um, cultivate to go a bit further. Because it's simply, it's not beyond you, it's for everyone. And we it need is. people. It's it's so true. It's it, I often compare it to, so I'm renovating this farmhouse that I, mean, I live on a farm. And, uh, and I'm like, okay, I, I'm not going to pay someone to do all the work. i got to figure it out myself. And how do I learn how to sand a floor? I've never done it. I am not a tradesperson, right? I'm, I'm a software developer. But it's like, okay, I'll figure it out. I'll go on YouTube or I find online resources or I ask a forum. Or It's a sort of a similar journey. It's like, okay, well, I am a floor sander. Now I want to go into cloud computing. Where do I even start? Well, you go and you find a YouTube video and you maybe you go to Pluralsight, you know, because you're here already and you get a free membership with this um, or trial with this with this event. And maybe you go and find that out and maybe you ask a, another forum or you find a Discord channel. You, you just, you find a way. There's so many resources that are so approachable that and then maybe one of them is your fundamentals um, certification on one of the Asia ones or the security, right? It's, uh, I think it's, People often don't know where to start, and that's the hard bit. Is like as soon as you sort of take that jump, and you go, "All right, I'm going to go for it now." There's so many resources depending on how you learn. A absolutely, and there many of them are free. They're readily available. They're self-paced. You can do them anytime. Um, it, it really just takes that inclination and interest. Yep. Yeah. Totally. And and I think that's. Often I get, I have got because I do a lot of this YouTube stuff, you know, stuff, you know, videos online and you know, cloud computing and events and conferences and all that. People go, okay, so which job should I get? Which is the best one? I'm like, well, what do you like doing? Right? <laughs> I can't answer that for you. So I, I can't say if you watching this security is right for you. I can just say that hey, security needs to be part of your journey if you're in tech, right? It's we can't say if it's the journey. Well said. I, I, I do think security is for everyone, but, yep. <laughs> I, but yeah. I agree. Yep. <laughs> and it's yeah. it's I I think programming as a as a skill should be taught from like year one in primary school or elementary school, right? It's mm -hmm. but that's just me again. I think that it's such a fundamental part of the world we live in that it should be it. And if you are then doing programming, then well, security is part of it. It's such a fundamental part of of how to do programming. So. Yeah, I agree. I think security is needs to be on your your radar somewhere. It doesn't have to be at the forefront, and it doesn't need to be everything you do, but you definitely need to be aware of it. And it's in all of the basic certifications, like the ASA nine hundred that I've done. Yeah. Security is part of it. Like we do talk about security because you need to know. So yeah, that makes sense. So all right, I guess what we're saying is the skill gap skills gap is huge. Like we we need everybody, well everybody that wants to, and there's so much opportunity for it. So that's um that's 
pretty much all we had on security and your learning journey and everything else with Gita. Thank you, Gita, very much for, for joining us. Um, if you do have any feedback, let us know, you know, put questions in the, you know, in the chat, whatever works for you. Um, where can we find more information about some of this, Gita, necessarily? Or, or do you want people to maybe find you on Twitter? How does that work? Oh, do follow Microsoft Learn, both on LinkedIn and Twitter, and we'll provide the links for that in the chat as well. Excellent. Yeah, that's good. There's a lot of content coming out on Microsoft Learn as well. Um, and Pluralsight. I should mention Pluralsight. Yes, I should mention Pluralsight. <laughs> uh, but yeah, thanks so much, Giza. Um, And I hope all of you have had a great day at Tech Skills Day. Um, and uh, until next time, thank you very much. Thanks. Bye. Ah, oh, there you go. That's better. Hmm. Oh, hi. Sorry. Yes. Ah, here we are back again. Thanks, Gita. That was, uh, what do you think? Cybersecurity. It's, um, it's one of those things that we, we just got to know about, really, to be honest. I think that's what we got out of that conversation. Um, now, that is the end of the formal presentations. Um, now, there will be a, uh, a slide now on the screen that shows you two QR codes. One is for submitting your answers for the Easter egg hunt. So if you found all the sunglasses, all the skulls with the sunglasses on them, put them in the form, put in as many as you found, and you might win a prize, a pretty cool prizes as well. Um, and then the other QR code is for joining us on Discord, because we're going to go and have a little bit of a, a hangout. We're going to answer questions, talk, et cetera. Um, it's all chat-based. So if you want to join us on Discord, use the other QR code. But other than that, thank you so much for joining us for Tech Skills Day. Um, again, you are eligible for a free uh, trial Pluralsight subscription. Um, and if uh, you need to know more about that, I'm sure there'll be details on the site or in the chat or wherever how to claim that. And uh, thank you so much for joining and I hope to see you on Discord very shortly. Uh, but that's it. Thanks for now and uh, see you later.